So good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Nancy Levison, a uh, professor at MIT, and um, we welcome you uh, to this uh, webinar. Um, this is, um, we, we tried to keep this smaller and more focused than the, the large webinar we had uh, if, about a month ago um, in order to be able to get more discussion and more participation and to focus in. So this time we focused on uh, uh, presentations and discussion on healthcare, stamp in healthcare. And we've got uh, all of the presenters are people who have worked um, and, and work in healthcare and have real experience using these things. Um, let me just briefly introduce them while we're waiting for people to, uh, to log on. Uh, Wal Grimmett is a, a MD anesthesiologist with 20 years of experience in regional Australia. He's um, uh, been working and interested in safety for, for a long time of complex systems. Todd Paliki is a professor and vice chair of the Department of Radiation Medicine and Applied Science at the University of California, San Diego. He's a recognized academic medical physicist with a focus on quality and safety. Aubrey Samost Williams is a, a, a doctor and a former student of mine. Um, who's a staff <laughs> anesthesiologist at Mass General Hospital, who specializes in va vascular and thoracic anesthesia as an in instruction in anesthesia at the Harvard Medical School. Um, her current topic focus is on proving patient safety through system design and analysis. John Thomas is a, a member of our department uh, at MIT, Aeronautics and Astronautics, and his work in, involves creating structured processes for analyzing cyber physical systems, uh, especially systems that behave in unanticipated, un, unsafe, and otherwise um, undesirable ways through complex interactions with each other and their environment. And uh, final, last but not least, uh, Lawrence Wong is a current PhD candidate at MIT. He's working on finishing his dissertation in this area, and he's interested in aviation, but his dissertation uh, and most of his interests uh, now are in healthcare safety. Uh, he's worked as an EMR uh, and got interested in healthcare while he was a um, in the aerospace engineering department. So it's sort of a jack of both trades. Um, I, for those of you who we, because we have participation from all over the world, um, uh, those, those of you who gotten up very early, uh, we certainly appreciate your efforts. Um, we, oh, that's right, Todd's West Coast. The West Coast especially um, has really suffered for, in this case, but we tried to help Wall this time um, <laughs> in Australia because he had to get up in the middle of the night. Uh, it's difficult to adjust all these time zones and, and get them uh, good for everyone. Um, we're going to start in um, a, just a couple of minutes. We want to make sure people have time to log in. Uh, we will be using Again, we want to encourage questions and discussion and interaction. Um, so we will be using the chat window. We will be, you can raise your hand and we will call on you. We're probably not going to interrupt the speakers while they're doing their, their short presentations, uh, but then we'll um, want to invite everyone to uh, participate and ask questions and make comments of your own and you talk about your own experiences and whatever. So um, I'm going to 
stop talking for a minute. If I've run out of things to say, uh, until it will start at 7.10, which is about a minute and a half from now. All right, so let's get started. I did the extended, uh, extenders are going to be introductions, um, bios first. Uh, so I'm going to, in order to allow the most time for people to speak uh, and not have me just droning on about bios. Um, so first, first up is Wal, Dr. Wal Grimmett. He's an anesthesiologist in Australia. Wal. Well, welcome everybody, and um, and thank you very much for asking me back. Um, just uh, so my name's Wal Grimmett, um, uh, anesthesiologist in Australia, although they're called anesthetists over here, but I'll stick with anesthesiologist to avoid just uh, confusion. So my background is I've done a lot of that in the past, uh, just at aeromedical evacs with, with helicopters. I've also done a fair amount in military as well. Uh, and for Lawrence, that's a C-17. Yes, it is a very cool aircraft. Uh, the, um, I also do a bit of teaching of medical students, and so that's the inevitable result of my teaching. I guess Nancy uh, knows about that. And now I do uh, anesthesiology. And I do have my coffee here this morning, which is well, this, well, this afternoon. Uh, in, to, I've always been interested in patient safety. In 2012, I had the honour, I served with the US Navy in Afghanistan, uh, but a pilot friend of mine, I said, oh, you need to read this. And he, uh, so that's what I, I took a whole lot of other books, obviously, but this was one that fascinated me when I was over there. And that was uh, uh, with Eric Conagle, uh, David Woods, and, and of course, Nancy Leverson at the bottom, uh, at the bottom there. And, and the history with that is I was fascinated by Fran. Uh, and uh, I love the language and the concepts and uh, and we began to do a few talks in Australia uh, over here, just just at a local level uh, down in, in Brisbane. And, uh, and there's a few people who are really quite interested in exploring got to the point that, hey, we've had this problem with a tourniquet and I, I wrote, did this one of them in the last talk I did. Um, can you, um, we want you to use Fram to investigate a tourniquet event. And then I sat down, I thought, great, and I looked at it again and I thought, I can't do it. Uh, I, I don't know how to make Fram work in, in, a, in a practical sense. Um, and part of it was, there's a lot of reasons for that, but part of it was just resources. Uh, and it, it wasn't for lack of trying. I've met Eric Olnagel, I've, uh, I've been to his master's course, so I've been to his other courses as well. Uh, but in terms of sitting down and doing something like this, where a, a leg has essentially died from a tourniquet event, uh, I didn't. Couldn't, I couldn't actually model it. So, uh, and that's the reason why we've all seen these models. And it wasn't so much that I thought with enough time I could make it work, but I put, how the heck was I going to communicate it afterwards? How was I going to explain to everybody my logic uh, to, to the conclusions I've come to? And I began to realize that'd take another month of lectures just to get the logic across. Uh, so I went back to CAST, uh, and that was its ease of use special reference, particularly the training burden uh, to investigators. Um, the resources were required uh, with reference to the number of personnel. You can do it with a very small number of personnel. Um, time required, um, it is more. Uh, in the previous talk, I, I went through all the times and documentation and costs. Uh, it seems about double an RCA. Um, but I could communicate the model, uh, in particularly communicating uh, my ideas and the logic to hospital and legal positions, uh, and particularly people such as coroners and that. Um, the other thing it was relatively easily to integrate uh, into a current quality and safety system. A lot of the this is a lot of similarities in the initial stages of the investigation between doing an RCA, which Australia is very big on, uh, where RCAs and uh, bow tie diagrams in, uh, in fog tree analysis, etc. Uh, all the other stuff essentially unheard of. Um, now, what I gave, when I gave the last talk, I went through all the you know, experience from the first five cases of investigations and, and what I'd sort of learned. What I was dying to talk about was these two, because I was actually doing two other investigations at the same time. But, um, and they really demonstrated some things that I, I just simply couldn't talk about because I didn't have legal um, permission. So in Australia, the way, I'm working at the moment, and it's pretty unique, is that I'm actually paid by the lawyers, so everything's medical, legal, and confidence. 
Uh, and so I have to get the lawyer's permission to discuss all these cases. But here's the beauty of it, and I don't know how this has happened. The lawyers are great. Uh, they've been incredibly cooperative. They, they want to see uh, just results from investigations. So, and they're very process driven. So they concentrate on the process, which is what we know, that's not the end, end results. But uh, this, there's a, basically uh, for the, I believe there's one anesthesiologist in the room, uh, Aubrey. Um, uh, essentially, this was uh, a dental anesthetic case where it's commonly around the world you get a bit of gauze and you shove it down the back of the kid's throat and uh, it sounds brutal, but that's essentially what it is after you put tubes down and everything. And the idea is the dentist makes a mess. There's pieces of teeth and blood and chips of bone and things go down. The, that bit of gauze or throat pack catches all that. You pull it out of the end and all, all the bad things that are going to happen are gone. Uh, and it's, it's a doctrine and dogma in anesthesiology. And I choose those words deliberately. Okay. The other thing you described is that in medicine, um, the, all the controls are hidden. Even the people in the room in this event didn't know what was actually happening and how they're actually working. It takes a long time to find out through interviews how the room is actually working from a systems perspective. Uh, they have um, operating procedures, but they're rarely if ever followed because they're trying to make variations to actually get the work done. Uh, so to actually find the controls is actually quite hard. And uh, particularly in medicine, that's what I'm finding. And basically this case demonstrated there's a wide variety and variation in mental models in the same room amongst operators who often work together. Uh, and you have to work at your interviews to get each person's uh, mental model out. And that's what I began to learn during this case. And that was different from other cases. The other thing is there's this amazing cognitive loading effect in terms of human factors, which is a separate topic. It's, it's, it's sort of outside what we're doing, but it's certainly demonstrated it beautifully in Zayo's paper years ago on uh, the effects of cognitive loading and anesthesiology uh, came up. And, and this is like your typical RCA initial timeline, but it works well in cast I'm finding as well. You simply map out exactly what's going on. Uh, and as you can see, the anesthetic uh, was, uh, an hour and a half dental anaesthetic, roughly. It's uh, not too bad. Everything went pretty well hunky-dory. All the disaster happened in the last six minutes. And what was that? Was that uh, uh, basically it was an induction, but uh, there was the primary scout in the theatre and there's a scout reliever. Then the primary scout came back and there's a primary anaesthetic nurse and an anaesthetic reliever. And, and then the anaesthetic nurse came back. But hidden in this is the detail. The anesthesiologist came into the room and that was the first time she'd worked in that room. In fact, it was, uh, and she wasn't the normal anesthesiologist of that team. She was very good. She's a pediatric anesthesiologist. She worked at the children's hospital. She hadn't worked in that theater before. And here's the thing that the hospital was losing money doing dental anesthesia. It was keeping it going because there's nowhere else for these kids to be done. So it's okay, we'll take a loss. So there's a lot of economic pressures on this place as well. So they'd set up an isolated dental anesthetic unit upstairs away from another theatre block, block with an isolated uh, post-op care unit as well. So suddenly you see a scenario growing, which is uh, heading towards disaster. And you could look at Swiss cheese models for that as well. You could create an event. But I don't think you would have got the same result I got by looking using cast, what I end up with here. Now, the dentist then said to the, the anaesthetist, you're responsible for putting the throat pack in, you're responsible for pulling out, I don't want to hear about it. Okay, that changed all the routine for every other dental dentist in the hospital. All the others, the dentist pulled it out, the anaesthetist put it in, or anesthesiologist put it in. So come to the end of the case, and uh, tea relief arrived. Now, so the anaesthetic nurse, you might forget relief for tea, no problems, you duck out. I'll be back before the case finishes. Case finishes early. So there was an anaesthetic reliever. Now, the scout nurse changed over at the same time as well. Now, she noticed the previous way that other scout nurse had written stuff on the board was all wrong. She began to really document all that. Uh, and she noted there was no throat pack written up there, but she thought, oh, that's the way they do it, stuff like that. Bottom line is, um, end of the case, the anesthesiologist pulled the tube out, kid looked fine, went out to post anaesthetic care unit, child came close to respiratory arrest, uh, re-intubated, found a throat pack. Uh, and you sort of think, from an RCA perspective, easy. 
uh, you would basically say an ethodist, anesthesiologist should have remembered to remove the throat pack. All these procedures and protocols were, were broken. Uh, things weren't documented properly. Or checklists weren't done properly, all that sort of stuff. And, I, and you sort of think, yeah, that's all true, but what's really going on? And uh, because the anesthesiologist is not dumb. Uh, <laughs> and the anesthetic nurse didn't deliberately leave the throat pack in either. And she was knocking herself up. We simply forgot to pull it out. How terrible are we? And she was in tears during the case. But what's actually happening? Um, and, and this is where I find CAST incredibly useful. I've, uh, as an anesthesiologist, I'm looking after an airway, okay? And I do actions to that airway, and those actions are based on what feedback I'm getting back from that airway. Uh, and that is basically what have I got? I've got the colour of the patient, I've got chest movement, levels of consciousness, I've got sounds and noises coming from that airway, I've got saturations from pulse oximetry, and I've got uh, end tidal carbon dioxide where people are breathing out and things like that. All very useful. But uh, what happens if I get a little airway hazard and I shove it down the back of the throat and hide it so nobody can see it, okay? So what actually happens to my feedback loops? Well, nothing, none of them are gonna work. And, and, and not only that, so let's go back to originally what control loops are. What are the features of control loops? Well, they have to be present. I need a control that's gonna be present, okay? It needs to be correct, the, the, the feedback. It needs to be, uh, the feedback needs to be, sorry, needs to be present, needs to be correct. It needs to be correctly timed and it needs to be of the correct duration, that's basic. So I look, okay, of all those feedback things, can any of them work? No, they can't, it's impossible. So we create a scenario which is impossible for the anesthesiologist to reliably to get adequate feedback to detect that it has its present. So the only thing he can do that I could think of, if you routinely got a big steel blade called a ringoscope, put it down the back of the kid's throat and had a look. Okay, it's the only thing you could physically do that would be reliable, that would meet those control feedback things. So that was the first thing I came up with. But they said, oh, they've, they've broken all these protocols and they've all these memory, th all these other things they should have done. They should have had stickers. They should have had things on the whiteboard. They should have had, it should have been documented on the charts. It should have been all this. And all that is true. It should have been. But they are memory aids. Okay, so okay, how do memory aids work? Well, they have to be initiated by somebody and then they have to be accurately recalled. But the trouble is they're all fallible. So the throat pack present should have been written on the whiteboard. But the first North thought of that, I don't do that routinely because that's, it's written on the count sheet anyway. But where it's on the count sheet is outside the normal part of the count sheet. So the count people doing the count think that's not part of our count, that's part of the anesthetic count. So, and everybody's mental model was totally different about how the same system was working. And this place had been working routinely for a year, okay? Uh, and so it, what CAS did, it dragged me back to what was actually happening. Uh, so we've got fallible memory aids. So I can say, yeah, remember more and use, be more vigilant is what I could have said. Singly, the most useless thing you can actually comment on out of an investigation. And even Queensland Health and the legislation says, don't ever do that. So it really just came back, there are no feedback observations and there's no aids that can do that can guarantee that this won't happen again. It's going to happen again. I can't guarantee it. There's very few system changes that I can make. And, and here's the thing is that RCA would have led me to hammer those memory aids. They're not going to work. CAST said, what system changes can I make? And it's basically saying there are very few, if any, you can actually make in this situation. So what it actually said was, okay, well, that's that control thing in terms of correct duration. It remind me to talk about it, so we'll skip that. But here's the other thing. There's that other thing that being th people have been thinking about this around the world as well, you know? And basically, why do you put throw packs down? Okay. Uh, in actual fact, there's no, as I said, it's dogma or doctrine. There's no evidence that throw packs do any benefit for the patient at all worldwide, but blue and neck, they've killed a few. Uh, and uh, there's lots of deaths associated with throat packs around the world. And, uh, and so you go back to the mental models again, and one of the girls was South Korea. Uh, and she was the one who was nearly in tears saying, we forgot to take it out. I said, where have you trained before, South Korea? How many years? 10 years, experienced anesthetic nurse. What do they do in South Korea? So we don't use them. 
We, we simply don't use them. It'd be, we, 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 we'd seen, it'd be seen as ridiculous. It's an Australian thing, she said. She thought it was really weird when they came to Australia. Okay. So the system change suggestions, which Cass led me to, was routine direct laryngoscopy. It was the only feedback loop I could add that could probably work. If you did it all the time, you're going to pick it up. Um, I thought, okay, if, we're going to, if they're going to use throat packs anyway, and I'm going to have the... And they're going to be retained. What's the safest place they can be retained in? Well, probably theatre. Don't have two you know, anesthesiologists putting the next patient asleep while the kid's choking the death from a throat pack in the pack. You just seemed a bad idea. So let's just do all the extubations in theatre uh, with the child fully awake. So at least we might have a chance of getting some feedback earlier. Because the kid's going to pick this up themselves anyway. Um, but the trouble is the way they're going to pick it up is they're going to have a respiratory arrest. Okay, and people are going to notice the child's not breathing and dying. That tends to be things. So all this is about how to get the throat pack out before the, in the intracheal tube comes out. Okay, okay. So the other thing is eliminate throat pack use entirely. And the other one was redesign a throat pack, and, and you could change the documentation. Documentation that was an obvious thing you could sort of do. Now I put it up as suggestions because here, here's the thing that I love about the some of the language. Intractable is that I, I was only in there for 20 hours during this investigation. I still don't fully know their system. They know it better than me. So what I can do is make suggestions to changes that I saw in an investigation, but they have to make those suggestions work within their system. Okay. And they're probably a better judge of that than I think. So I put it as suggestions. Okay. The other one that was totally different, I've never done before, and I thought, how do you make CAS work in this, was I, I got a letter from the hospital saying, look, we've got a bit of a problem. We've got this letter from the coroner. Do you think... Um, you've got it, we, do you think you'd want to have a look at this? And I, my immediate response is, oh yes, it sounds fascinating. And this is the letter from the coroner. It says, my investigation has been informed by advice from an independent doctor from Department of X, who's reviewed the record from X and X hospitals. The reviewing doctor has raised concerns regarding uh, Mr. X's discharge, considered as if it had not been discharged, he may not have died, okay? So yeah, they've got a major problem, okay? They're saying they discharged him too early. And the reviewer also raised concerns regarding the lack of documentation surrounding the case. So what it actually, so go into this little thing and this, and uh, so I'll set up a cast investigation. So that's how I start. Uh, and the uh, hospital said, we'll send you all the information. So they sent me 190 pages of randomly presented data from the electronic medical record system. And I said, is this exactly what you sent to the coroner? So this is exactly what you sent to the coroner. It's all there. I said, fantastic. I spent 10 hours trolling through 109 pages trying to get a timeline. Okay. And all the data for this treatment of this patient was there and it was correct and it was perfect. Okay. And what uh, wasn't there was that it took 10 hours to, it was, it was all hidden in this total disorganized noise. And I basically said, well, you, I'm trying to work out how this would fit into a car system and what models I'd have to draw. And I was going to spend hours drawing control loops and everything. And then I thought, well, you know what? I don't have to. Um, Nancy's already done all this for me. It's uh, to try and communicate this result is that uh, I can just get a generic, Cast control diagram. I've got a government regulatory agency. I've got a company, which is the hospital, and I've got adverse coronial finding. And the reason I've got that is the accident incident report is a total disaster. Okay. And then I, I so four and a half pages report was simply saying these are all the reasons why the coroner didn't look at your case because the treatment was actually perfect. It was all there. It was all documented. It was just randomly arranged. So it was a it was a, just a totally different problem. Uh, and a totally different way of looking at it. And they've gone back to simply reorganize the electronic medical record system as a result. Was the treatment, the problem wasn't the problem. They thought the problem was the treatment of the patient. The problem, the problem was the way they presented the data to a regulatory agency. So it was an interesting way. So what I learned is the problem needing investigation is not always clear when you start. And generic control loops can save you lots and lots of time and communication. I still need a psychology degree. I think people picked up on that. Here's the other thing. I'm still not getting feedback, but the feedback I am getting is every, uh, from all those people who are crying is we are doing it. There's a big issue with second victim harm here. Uh, one of the nurses I interviewed over a year ago hasn't worked again. Uh, she's a good nurse and she simply hasn't worked. 
And I thought, okay, uh, well, how am I gonna get a study up arranged on this? Uh, but essentially, admin, lawyers, staff, everybody is in, on the same boat. They also, um, we really need to look at this. So I'm, it directed me to another um, psychology research project looking at second victim harm from investigative incidents. So um, the other thing that I was really coming up was that there are a lot of generic studies out there. Throat packs are going to be retained all over America. Okay, they might not always report it, but they're going to be happening. So would pooling of our investigations and findings allow us to save duplicating some of our efforts? Uh, in particular, retained throat pack is going to be happening everywhere. The control models could be easily uh, done by anybody, those sort of simple control models. Um, John's doing, at the moment, looking at pain. Um, you're doing the STPA analysis, I believe, on pains, and that involves pumps. One of the cases I investigated, the pump actually was known to be faulty. It didn't cause the event I investigated, but it would have mimicked it exactly. The FDA already knew about it. Our TGA equivalent already knew about it. But the control stuff and everything that John's doing could have easily put into my investigation. So are we creating too much work for ourselves by not having, not being able to pull some of our data? And that's something just for the audience today. But here's the other bizarre thing. The legal guy came back and said, I get it. I finally get it. Okay. And I thought, why? Why do you suddenly get it? You've had five cases. Why do you suddenly get these? And, uh, and, and, and I think one of the things I'd like to put to the audience is, are we creating too many problems for ourselves? This is what an outside audience is seeing. And we used to say, and that's what we tend to, we tend to be looking at that. Uh, we want them to look at that sort of stuff. Um, we're stuck here and we've got bow ties and rules. And that's what the outside observers are really looking at. We've got this huge choice. We want them to go, they've got that huge choice outlined in the dream, sorry. We want them to go here in terms of their thinking um, but we're saying that's the one that's correct. I think I'm shooting myself in the foot. Currently, I'm moving to another organisation and they're saying, yes, yeah, STEM's good, but we need another model that's more medical specific. But Nancy was saying at the last meeting, I spent 35 years trying to get into medicine and I can't get any penetration. I can't get some leeway. So if we start presenting another model in, within STEM, uh, and, you know, and I haven't even looked at ESPN and ESP, uh, ESPL, and I have a little bit of a look at Fram. Maybe we need, as a group, need to be concentrating. We need to look at uh, all the, um, the models in, in terms of class and start using that and start getting some penetration in terms of quality and safety for that. I mean, and Stanton talked about this in terms of the various models. He did a great paper. He just compared them all. I'll pull out one of his things. Here's one of the problems. Uh, this came out. Oh, I forget the paper now. There's 106 different STS-based methods that have been identified at the moment. So that's what people are looking at. So maybe we need to get people to be focusing, and this is Stanton's diagram, on syst um, systematic methods rather than cognitive methods, move on and move everybody towards either stamp, cast, fram. Uh, because part of the problem that's happening is we're trying to communicate all this is our communication is causing some harm. And Decker put this article, he just published it online through Griffiths, it's not peer reviewed. But he basically showed that the communication story that we give has profound impact on the actions by people outside. And I thought it was interesting that we can start causing uh, the language we use and the way we can communicate affects the actions of the people we're making these reports to. So we've got a responsibility to make sure that all, everybody's on the same page. And I'm just thinking, you know, maybe we should go back to this, is that, uh, which is Nancy's, that 2004 article, and I always bring it up. Um, Fram, ESPL, ESPN, and Stamp all do this. I think it's the gold standard for models. Now, I, I don't want to go back to that. Don't, don't, don't get me wrong. Uh, that's horrible. I don't have the time. I don't have the resources. I probably don't have the brain power. Um, but uh, I say we, I'm using a systematic method of investigation looking at complex systems, my choice in this case is STEM. It's probably going to be easy to explain rather than try and, um, uh, try and just highlight why I'm using an individual one and rather than argue why I'm using STEM rather than FRAM because they're very similar in a lot of ways. So it's beginning to strike me. Both STEM and FRAM have functional units. units. Both describe complex adaptive systems. Both have operator mental models versus work as done versus work as imagined. I don't like work as imagined as terminology. So do... Do we need to sell non-linear modeling as a whole? 
rather than burn resource time in explaining and justifying individual models for investigation as a, as a group involved? And do we still need more industry specific models when we still can't communicate our current models to those outside quality assurance? As I'm moving to another organisation and the first thing they're saying to me is, oh, we need something that's specific for, so we need to adjust stamp and cast that makes it more medicine specific. I'm wondering if we're shooting ourselves in the foot. So it still comes back to this, all models are wrong, some are useful. And that's essentially the end of my talk. And I'm sorry if I've gone over time. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Um, we we have a few more time for a few questions if, or comments if anyone wants. Uh, if you raise your hand, Lawrence will unmute you. Or alternatively, people can uh, type their questions into the chat box as well, and we can definitely field those. Well, we're not going to force anyone to ask anything. <laughs> we'll just continue. Um, if there's, if, and maybe people get more, uh, have more questions or more um, ideas about comments later. We do have a time for open discussion at the end. We we reserved, and I should tell you, we've also put a couple breaks in because we know it's very hard to watch webinars for a long time. So I see that uh, Aubrey actually just raised her hand, so I'm going to unmute Aubrey. And Aubrey, you're alive. Hey, uh, thanks, Walt, for that, that really interesting talk. Um, one thing that I'm curious about, because it's something that uh, my team and I are, are facing on a, a different project, is what was really, wh what did you turn into the investigators in terms of your, your cast analysis? Like, what did you give them? What was the best thing to really communicate with them? Because we're pretty concerned. Um, we're, we have to take our findings up to higher level management, who's got really no background in this. And we want to give them something that's not a fixed stack of like just writing, um, but, but what really was the most useful? Oh, just a minute while you're, you're muted. Yeah, sorry, I, I muted myself just to so be rude. It, it, it's, it's a hard question to answer because I'm struggling with exactly the same thing because I'm not getting any feedback as well, except that one, a few comments, the lawyer just basically said, I'll finally get it. He actually made it to somebody else and they reported it back to me. Uh, and, uh, the 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 main thing seems to be good summaries uh something they can scan right at the beginning like a good abstract in a paper uh so they if you if you've got these are the uh these are my summary of recommendations <coughs> excuse me and that might make them read on um a lot of the stuff where I tried to explain cast and how it worked and everything, basically, you know, we're not interested in that. Uh, but simple control loops uh, and diagrams like that, they, they were interested in. Um, and that, that was the main thing. It was a, a good summary right at the beginning, just like good writing. Uh, control loops are reasonably interested in. Great details about how you came to that conclusion nobody was really interested in at all, uh, which, is, which is really quite sad when you've spent so much time putting all those control loops together and bought lucid chart software so they can all be pretty. Um, when they do like the control loops, you know, just simple things like color coding of the arrows, they, they found reasonably useful. Um, you know, just control loops that are dodgy, broken arrows, things like that, just simple, really simple uh, communication writing techniques rather than anything, rather than the absolute logic. How to engage them in the logic, um, I'm still struggling with. But we're not in bad company, as Nancy said, she's struggling with it as well. So we're going to go on. Let me uh, introduce uh, Lawrence Wong. Uh, but he's going to walk you through an, a cast example. Now, I want to uh, give credit where credit is due, uh, actually. Dr. Aubrey Samos-Williams, who just 
asked the question was actually did originally did this cast analysis as part of her master's thesis. It was a real adverse event uh, uh, that took happened during surgery, cardiac surgery at Rush a Medical Center. And uh, there were 36 events that uh, were not protected, were not prevented um, by the use of, of a uh, the WHO checklist during surgery. Uh, so we went in and Aubrey went in and uh, looked at why I investigated these 36 events using CAST and to understand why they hadn't be pre been prevented and what could be done about it. Um, so first we're going to hear from, uh, from Lawrence and then after that we're going to hear from Aubrey who's going to talk about more recent experiences she's had now in uh, perioperative uh, peri uh, patient care. So, Lawrence. All right, awesome. I uh, just want to check that my slides and my sound is coming over all right? Yes. Okay, great. All right, hello everyone. Uh, so you have heard from Wall about how exciting doing a CAS analysis can be and how insightful it is. So uh, let's try and see if we can do this ourselves like in a very short time frame. So again, uh, Nancy already mentioned that a lot of the materials and details are generated from Aubrey's work. So I want to acknowledge that as well. Uh, today, we have this exercise and there are sort of two short objectives to it want to fo uh, show how a basic CAS analysis is structured, meaning we want to show you how the different parts of a CAS sort of built upon each other. And then we also want to give you a hands-on uh, opportunity to apply some of the CAS skills. Uh, in particular, we want you to get a chance to answer or sit, first of all, the questions, and then maybe get some ideas as to why the events happened the way they did. And these are very crucial aspects for us to get a comprehensive and impartial analysis out in the end. Now, having said what the objectives are, I want to caveat that this is not a technical discussion of surgery and anesthesiology. I, for one, am not qualified to provide that kind of content, and I'm sure there are some very good avenue to get that information. I would like to get a lot of that uh, in-depth knowledge in the future as well. Okay, so let's get right to it. Um, here, here is a chart laying out the basic CAS analysis and how the different uh, parts are. So CAS is a five part process. In part one, we want to assemble some basic information. Uh, for example, identifying what the proximal events are to the incident. And what is important here is that we want to set some starting questions that we will be using in later parts of the analysis to get to know the events and the causes better. In part two, we're going to uh, model the safety control structure. And the idea here is that we just want to get a basic understanding of how the system works, how the different parts of the system interact or relate to each other. Part three of the analysis is really the meat of the analysis. Here we actually analyze each of the relevant controllers or different parts of the system in detail. And uh, not only do we want to identify what happened with the incident, but we actually seek to understand why it happened the way it did. Uh, you may also wonder, how do we know which part of the system to uh, explore or to examine? Because you know, at the end of the day, the system is complex. The answer is that we're going to use the findings from our uh, preliminary part of the uh, analysis to guide our exploration or the journey around the system. All right, in part four here, uh, with the causal factors sort of identified for different parts of the system, we then take a step back to see if there is any kind of general pattern uh, that we can see with the different causal factors. In other words, we want to identify if there are any systemic factors that negatively impact uh, multiple parts of the system, if not all parts of the system. Some of the common example includes uh, safety culture or economics factors and so on and so forth. And lastly, in part five, of course, having found out about what uh, was happening that contributed to the incident, we want to figure out some safety interventions so that we make suggestions to improve the system as well. Okay, for the uh, case that we're going to be analyzing today, the incident, it is a sur uh, cardiac surgery incident, and the incident happened in the course of treating a 56-year-old male. 
the patient had a history of heart failure and had to receive a heart transplant because he was getting persistent infection from his left ventricular assist device, LVAD. Uh, the, after the surgery, the patient was actually stable as he was moved to the intensive care unit. However, he experienced decreased cardiac function subsequently, and he was treated with immunosuppressant for presumptive acute graft rejection. Unfortunately, uh, the patient expired after several days despite maximal support that was provided. All right, so let's dive down to the CAS analysis uh, right away. So in part one, we want to sort of get a little bit more detail about the incident, right? So we're also organizing some of that information in, in the sense of a list. Uh, first, we know that a donor heart was be, uh, available for the transplant, and then the patient was taken to the operating room for the transplant surgery, but without having received the immunosuppressant. Uh, the transplant surgery then, of course, started, and uh, the patient um, also received that surgery somewhat successfully without any kind of misadventure. The rest of the clinical course was basically as described previously, all right? So this is sort of the... Um, immediate set of events. Now let me t take a pause here to describe this step of organizing the proximal events. Our purpose of uh, generating this list is really just to know just enough about what happened to start the analysis instead of being exhaustive. At the end of the day, we can always toss in more events onto this list. However, we don't really need to get all that details here because our subsequent uh, exploration will really reveal what additional details that are relevant. What we need to do though with this list is to generate some questions to explore what and why the events occurred. So let's come get some practice in here, okay? So you can pull up your chat window. Uh, can you think of a question that is relevant here? And let's uh, type your answers or ideas into the chat windows, and then we can sort of like uh, take a look at it. All right, I have my chat window up. Okay, I do see answers coming in now, great. Okay, yeah, what is the standard procedure for pre-transplant uh, immunosuppressant? That's a great question. Okay, who was aware? Yeah, right, that's right. Did the people know that uh, they did not receive, or the patient did not receive the immunosuppressant? Right, why was the patient not given it? Is there a checklist? Uh, was, there, uh, was there some sort of memory aid as uh, Wall talked about? Okay, all these are very good questions. Very good, awesome. So we're just going to advance um, just in the interest of time. So let me go forward here. All right, so here are some of the uh, questions that basically align very well with a lot of the questions that you got generated already. For example, was uh, pre-op immunosuppressant indicated? If it was indicated, was it prescribed? Why or why not? If it was prescribed, importantly, why was it not administered? We already know that uh, it was not administered, but that is crucial to find out why. Okay, so if we move on to the next event down the list, that is also interesting as well. Uh, another question get, that can be asked here is that if immunosuppressant was indicated, why did the surgery start without it having been administered? And this is sort of along the lines of, okay, did the surgical team know that the immunosuppressant was not prescribed or what was not administered, my apologies. Okay. So now we're going to move forward just, again, in the interest of time. All right, uh, throughout the analysis, we want to keep in mind how the relevant parts of the system interact with each other. And because CAS is a systems theoretic tool, it's a, taking a systems approach. So we use something called a safety control structure to represent these kind of interactions. A safety control structure is a graphical model and it consists of different control loops and you already heard some of that from uh, Wall's presentation. Now for analysis efficiency, we can use a pre-built model. A pre-built model would uh, enable you to have to create less control loops for a particular analysis. And here in this exercise today, we have a simple example for cardiac surgery. So let's sort of uh, have a quick walkthrough of this uh, simple pre-built control model. 
All right, here, what you're seeing is sort of the very high level view of uh, a surgery um, system, right? Or a system to deliver cardiac surgery, I should say. This provides sort of like a 30,000 feet view. And as you already know, the healthcare system isn't comprised of just the healthcare organization alone. It is of course regulated uh, by, you know, regulatory bodies such as the Food and Drug Administ Agency in the US and uh, also advisory bodies such as the American College of Surgeons. You also have the uh, device manufacturer here that provide equipment such as the anesthesia machine. And of course, the healthcare organization provides care to the patient, but it may also interact with other providers and organizations as well, right? So hopefully this sort of high level view is somewhat uh, intuitive to you. But now let's expand the healthcare organization, sort of like dive uh, one level deeper to look at the inner workings. After zooming in, you see a little bit more of the detailed interactions. Briefly, I just wanna cover the uh, important entities here. You've got the institutional executive, and they of course set goals and allocate resources and so on and so forth. And then you've also got the leaders of the Department of Surgery and Surgical ICU, and they perform uh, important decisions on training and managing operations, etc. Uh, as we already alluded to, the manufacturers, of course, design and install and maintain the devices that are used on the front line. Um, so that is sort of like the overall layout of uh, safety control structure. Now, I would actually like to zoom in a little bit to explain the concept of uh, control loop a little bit, sort of like reinforce the message that Wall already gave. Um, so let's look at the interactions between the executives and the Department of, uh, Department of Surgery Management, right? The executives, of course, perform actions such as allocating resources and setting policies and things like that. And these are depicted on the downward arrow because they influence the behavior of the parts that are uh, sort of like uh, modeled in the lower parts of the system, sort of like towards the frontline level. And at the same time, we recognize that this kind of interaction is not a one-way street, but instead, all the decisions that the executives make should be informed by things like safety intervention or the operation metrics and uh, budget requests, for example. These are the information that gets really fed back up to the executives uh, from, let's say, a particular department or even from the front line in the case of an incident report. So there is this loop kind of interaction that is going on here that is actually crucial for us to consider as we analyze the events. All right, so there is, that's what I want to say. Now we can um, sort of like zoom in a little bit more at the frontline level to look at the interactions at the surgery delivery. So again, I'm not going to go through all the details on this slide, but I just wanna mention that of course, um, before the surgery took place, this patient was very sick. So uh, I guess in general, the cardiac patients may be cared for in the surgical intensive care unit. And in this particular um, setting, of course, there is the sick nurse that makes a lot of de decisions and deliver a lot of the care. For example, uh, giving the pre-op medications and so on and so forth. Now when it, uh, and of course the sick nurse has to interact with the surgical team. When it comes to the surgery itself, you've got very important uh, players in the surgical team, such as the circulating nurse, the surgical fellow, the attending sur a cardiac surgeon, anesthesiologist and perfusionist and so on and so forth. Uh, one last thing that I want to mention about this pre-built model is that not all the depicted interactions are going to be relevant to a particular incident. And similarly, there may be interactions that are not depicted but should be examined. And in this case, you would need to build some new control loops as your analysis progresses, just like how Wall did in a lot of his analysis. But uh, this sort of pre-built model give you a starting point so that you have to build less, hopefully. All right? Great. So we're going to keep moving forward uh, just because of our time limit. Now we're getting to part three of the CAS analysis, which is actually quite exciting. Our goal in part three is to really determine why it made sense to the decision makers involved to do what they did at the time of the incident. And there is a process so that we can arrive at this information in the end. We first look at each component to identify the decisions and actions that contributed to the incident. But then rather than stopping there, we also wanna take the next step 
of identifying why the decision and action was made or not made. And this is analyzed from the angles of the component's flawed understanding and the contextual factors that were at play. All right, I'll just give you a moment for that to sink in. Not only do we want to identify what happened, but we want to identify why. And the why we look at it from the angles of mental model flaws and the contextual factors. There is actually an important principle underlying this approach. Um, that is, we believe that until proven otherwise, every part in the systems try to do a very good job with their roles and responsibility. And their decisions and actions are influenced by the context. And therefore, we need to identify and address these contextual factors so that safety can be improved fundamentally rather than superficially. All right, returning to the analysis, uh, remember the questions that we set when we identified the list of events. Here, we actually have gathered additional information. We know that the pre-op immunosuppressant was indicated and it was actually prescribed, uh, but we know that it was not administered and our key, um, uh, I guess like a, a key question here now is why not? And to know sort of like how to go forward, we need to find out who is responsible for administering the pre-op medications. Now, if you remember from our walkthrough on the safety control structure, the CQ nurse is uh, the party that is responsible for administering these. So let's start our component analysis here. We have identified that uh, the responsibility and the contribution is that um, the CQ nurse did not give the pre-op immunosuppressant. And if we just, um, and, and many analysis tend to just stop here and sort of like uh, portray the sick nurse almost as the uh, blame morphy party. But we really need to do better than that, right? So we need to identify the mental model flaws and contextual factors. So again, I will toss the ball to you. Uh, let's open up your chat window and practice. What kind of questions do you think would be good to inquire the mental model flaws and contextual factors? So any ideas on, uh, so I, I guess like to prompt your thinking a little bit, right? You can think about, all right, um, our actions are informed by information that receive, uh, just as like what Wall was saying, um, what kind of information did the uh, CQ nurse get or what their beliefs may be as to uh, what, what the, um, the event was, what they are supposed to do. Okay, all right, yeah, great. Did the sick nurse know that it was their job to administer the medicine? Right. Perfect. So I'm just gonna keep advancing in the interest of time. Here are some of the questions that we can ask, right? Did the sick nurse know about the need, as you have pointed out, but also more generally, uh, did the nurse know what pre-op medications to give? How did they find out about that information? And uh, what are their understanding of other parties in the system, right? Like what do the surgical team do? Who gives what medications? And if you looked into these uh, kind of questions, then the situation becomes more interesting. Yes, we recognize that the sick nurse was not aware of the need to give the immunosuppressant, but interestingly, there are several factors that led to this flawed understanding. First, all the pre-op medications and testing would be ordered by the surgical team the night before, and this is done through the EHR but the EHR doesn't have a very clear interface as to who is supposed to give the medication. And interestingly, the, uh, the medications are ordered as part of an order set. Uh, there are some interesting conflicts here though. For example, the antibiotics are ordered as well, but then they are not supposed to be given by the floor nurses. And instead they are given in the OR. So you can sort of see why there may be a confusion as to who is responsible for giving what medication, specifically the immunosuppressants. Uh, in the backdrop, there is an interesting aspect that um, there, the center didn't use to perform a whole lot of cardiac transplant uh, to begin with and up until this point. But at the time there was a recent change of leadership which made for a new push for doing this kind of surgery. So you see that, that they may not have a very clear concept of who is supposed to give what kind of medications. All right, so as a quick summary of our analysis so far, uh, early on from the list of events, we generated some questions. 
that led to the question of why was the pre-op immunosuppressant not administered? And that sort of led us to focus on the CQ nurse as a start, right? And by asking the questions or answering the questions that we just did, we identified some mental model flaws and contextual factors. And these useful information actually lead us to generate additional questions. For example, why does the EHR not specify who is responsible for execution? And uh, these are very um, important questions to ask and we need to ask it to um, the EHR manufacturer, for example, that would be the intuitive choice. But also, we should probably ask that question to departmental or institutional management also. Like, uh, did you consider this particular aspect of the EHR when you were selecting the product or in your procurement process? That is also interesting to find out as well. Uh, additionally, some other question may involve, was there any procedure? Did you uh, agreement between the Department of Surgery and SICU? What kind of coordination did you uh, take and so on and so forth. So this, I hope you see that from doing your initial part of the analysis, you will generate additional questions and those questions would get tagged to the different uh, components within the system. And that sort of like uh, sets your journey to your exploration around the system. All right, so because of the time limit, we really don't have uh, the opportunity to analyze in depth the rest of the frontline interactions. And because much of the frontline context is set by um, the higher level controllers as we depicted, so we should really move up to the next level. Let's um, take a look at the Department of Surgery Management and see what is going on there. All right, from identifying their responsibility, we know that they are supposed to oversee and ensure proper procedure use. And then they're also supposed to investigate in incidents and accidents. Now, unique to this particular incident though, the procedure, the use of checklists and timeout did not actually ensure safe practice in the operating room. And they did not investigate the incident until two other similar ones has occurred. So again, what kind of mental model flaws and contextual factors can you think of? And uh, what kind of questions can we use to tease this out? All right, so I see some questions about how busy your incident in the CQ, and that is an important question. But then we probably want to uh, look at how, how the uh, departmental uh, management came about in setting their procedure use and uh, investigation perhaps as well. So what kind of questions can people think of to tease out that kind of information? All right, yeah. Let's look at their incident reporting system. What kind of uh, information do they tell people to, um, I guess, to report, to address, and so on and so forth? Okay, how many reports do they get and things like that? Great, so again, just in the interest of time, I'm going to move forward. So some of the other questions uh, surrounding the procedure setting or the policy setting aspect is, um, how did they come about you know, using the checklist, all right? And uh, what is their understanding of the challenges uh, surrounding the front line? Uh, did you get information about you know, these challenges maybe from your observation or from the incident reporting system and things like that? And at the same time, we sort of like want to explore that kind of coordination piece. Uh, what is the management understanding of the SICU or the cardiac care um, policies and so on and so forth? So if you look into these aspects a little bit more, again, you would uh, identify some interesting information that sort of gives you a, a refreshed view of their actions. It was found out that uh, the Department of Surgery Management believed that the staff knew exactly what to order and how to administer all the medications. And there are sort of like a few reasons why. Uh, first, there may be a false sense of security that was generated from implementing the checklist that was derived from WHO sur surgical safety checklist. I think it is reasonable to think that uh, the checklist was effective or else the WHO wouldn't have published it, right? However, you would be surprised to find that neither the original WHO checklist nor the adapted version that was used in this center was actually validated in cardiac surgery. So that is actually uh, quite a twist there that, you know, that underlied their decision making. And also there might be some unfounded confidence um, that no longer apply. And what I mean is that 
this was a new surgical management team that got transplanted to this hospital. And they come, they come from an environment that was basically the expert in doing cardiac transplants, but that is no longer the case in this new environment. And instead, this new environment really rarely performed transplant until this new team of management came on board. And separately, uh, there was also silos between the surgery department and intensive care. And so there was really very little coordination between the two units. So there you have it. There are some really uh, complex contextual factors that are at play here. Again, having analyzed this part of the system, it generates additional questions such as why was there not a plan in place to help move uh, from a center that rarely performed transplants to one that specializes in them. And we can definitely probe this aspect a little bit more with the institutional executive. At the same time, you, you might even want to take it up to the WHO, and I think there is a good value here. Why was the checklist never validated in cardiac surgery? That is certainly some important questions. All right, we're coming to the end here. Uh, I just want to quickly highlight that after looking at the individual perspective of what happened and why it happened, we also want to take a step back to see if there is any kind of uh, systemic factors that negatively impacted the behavior of many or even all of those components. And these systemic factors would be very important to address, right? Uh, it is a little bit challenging with the exercise because we haven't taken a comprehensive look. But then I would just highlight that uh, fluid communication is definitely involved here. For example, we can see that there was issue between the SICU and um, nurse and the surgical fellow at the handoff. And for example, there was also uh, problems with the circulating nurse and the rest of the surgical team's communication at timeout, leading them to believe that, oh, the patient was good to go, um, this cardiac transplant could proceed. And at the management level, there's other kind of communication issues as well. Okay, so that was a quick whirlwind tour of a quick CAS analysis. And I just wanna uh, sort of wrap up by summarizing on a few points, okay? Safety incidents in healthcare are complex. They are almost certainly involve multiple parts of the system. And taking a systems approach here would enable you to learn more. And by identifying the mental model flaws and contextual factors that underlie the human behavior, we can avoid blame and get into the more meaningful causal factors. And in turn, hopefully this information enable us to come up with better solutions. Next, you now know that the basic CAS analysis um, is structured in terms of five parts. And then they sort of like build upon each other and your initial findings are going to guide you through your subsequent part of the analysis. Um, Lastly, I just want to uh, point out that we are coming up with some developments that hopefully will enable you to perform your CAS analysis more efficiently and consistently. And we would love to work with you on developing some of these, especially for your particular domain. Uh, for example, here, what you have seen is a pre-built safety control structure that sort of captures some of the major interactions that uh, are taking place in the system. So lastly, I just want to thank you for the opportunity to talk to you and I'll be happy to take any questions. All right, so we're ready to take questions. Um, I'm just, just to give, first of all, you know, uh, Lawrence did a great job, but we only could look at parts of it. A lot of your questions that you, in the chat window looked at other aspects. And in fact, Aubrey looked at other things. For example, um, it turns out that almost every component in this control structure, including the electronic health record had uh, and didn't provide information about whether it, it had the uh, immunosuppressant had been given or not. So everything had some flaws in it that we could learn from and improve. And instead of just blaming the nurse or or the the uh, the surgeon, we can get a much better better picture of the entire thing and fix all of these things hopefully at once. So then we can really reduce the number of future incidents. So um, we're open for questions. Oh, let me just say we're, um, we're sort of in the, in the break uh, period. So feel free to take a break if you want. We will be starting again at 8.20 uh, with Dr. Samos Williams, who's gonna talk about her, some of her more recent experiences using CAS. Um, but we will take questions and, um, and and uh, 
whatever you'd like to do during this break session too. We just don't want you to feel guilty about getting up and taking a break. So raise your hand if you'd like to make a comment maybe or type something in the chat for them. Uh, someone, yeah, we were trying to, what we wanted to do is show you how to do it, what the thinking's involved. Of course, you know, in 20, you wouldn't have done the whole thing in 20 minutes, uh, which, all, which is all uh, Lawrence had. Um, but you can see with an hour or two of this, I mean, it, it's not taking a week to do this. With a, an hour, a couple hours, you could get a really pretty um, extensive uh, uh, comprehensive and, and interesting analysis using this kind of thought process. So there is a question on the chat window. Is it possible to allocate responsibility to individual component, for example, part A, 10%, part B, 19%, et cetera? I think that would be hard. And, and that may not be what uh, we go after. I think what is more important is to see how the different parts contributed to the incident to find out really the underlying contextual factors so that we can address them and uh, sort of take this holistic improvement in system safety. So that would be my answer. I don't know if Nancy has other things to add. Well, you know, our goal is not to find someone to blame. That's the wrong goal. You, you set that as the goal and you can do that in 10 minutes. In fact, we can do it before it happens. So we're gonna blame the nurse. And if we can't blame the nurse as a technician, we're gonna blame the doctor. So before we even have the incident, we know that we're gonna, who's gonna be blamed for the responsibility. Um, the, the, the important part is we're trying to say that that doesn't exist. There's not one responsible person. Everybody is working within a larger system and has to deal with the, the issues, the, the difficulty, uh, the flaws in the larger system. So our goal really is to find why were the controls that were built into this system and lots of controls. I mean, people, there's been, we know about wrong administration of medications. That's highly controlled in the hospital environment. It didn't work in this case. And as it turned out in, in lots of other cases. So the question is, why weren't the controls effective and how do we build more effective controls? That's gonna get us farther than figuring out who was responsible or what their percent of responsibility is. All right, go back. Lawrence, sorry, didn't it take uh, over? No, no, all good. That, that was really good. Yeah, it's, that's why we're here. We'd love to hear from you, Nancy. <laughs> Awesome. So uh, in the chat window, I guess I'm just, uh, let me glance here over on the time. Oh, how old they go? Ah. <laughs> it's early in the morning. My blood pressure is still pretty low. Um, you learn nothing from what looking at what goes right. This is what we know in engineering. When it goes right, it goes right in that hospital and has gone right 99.8% of the time people get the right medication. What have you learned from that? What you learn is nothing. Uh, it, something goes right just because there weren't some other conditions you weren't even aware of that didn't occur. And you can't learn anything from what goes right. What you learn is when it goes wrong unfortunately, or maybe almost wrong. You know, hopefully we get these when incidents occur rather than the real losses and we can learn before we actually, somebody gets injured. But you, 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 if it goes right, how do we know why it went right? Was it just an accident? Was it just a coincidence? Was it just um, a chance that things went right? We don't learn anything from that. Um, I, I disagree strongly with with Eric Kolnagel's um, approach because I it blames everything on humans and it's looking not looking at the most important stuff, which is why did it go wrong? Yeah. Now, if I could 
add to that, even if you're system neutral in terms of methodology between stamp and fram, if you're going to say, okay, we're going to look at right and try and improve what doing right more often, uh, and that, that re involves developing resilience, you've got to go down resilience assessment grids, and uh, they're worse than fram hexagonals. It's it, it, it's a nightmare. Um, and, and again, that's coming back to me just as a dumb anesthesiologist, and it's coming back to Nancy's points as well. You've got to make the system work, and then you've got to communicate it. So maybe that is an approach that could work, but I simply don't have the time or resources uh, and a whole academic department to throw at it. And where it has been tried, that's what that's what, and they have published on it. That's what they've done. They've, you know, they'll have ten or fifteen people working three to four weeks working on one. Um, clinical practice guideline for entry into an intensive care. Uh, I, nobody's going to have the resources to, to do that at the moment. Um, uh, so it, it, practically, it, it, if you're an academic, we'd love to explore it, but um, I've got to go to work tomorrow and somebody's going to come to me with a problem and I've got to come up with some sort of recommendation or solution with a methodology that I can use tomorrow because I can get another one of these tomorrow. And I can't use resilience assessment grids to explore resilience of organizations uh, along that philosophy. And the other, going back to the point on, um, can you do percentages? Um, you, you can, if you go down a root cause analysis methodology where we assume um, systems can be broken down into subsets and uh, looking at sub and sub and sub analyze each subset, uh, but the whole thing about doing systems analysis is that's fundamentally wrong. Uh, so it's very, very hard to get individual qualitative, uh, individual component um, error probabilities when you're looking at a whole system as a, as a whole, uh, which, which is what systems analysis does. It's, it's, it's a fundamentally flawed logic, I suspect. It comes down to uh, as much as that as anything else. And, uh, and it'd be lovely to be able to drift away from uh, that entirely. It's incredibly appealing to managers, I suspect. You know, there's 10% chance this part's gonna go wrong, we'll accept that as a risk. But I think it's a very poor way to look at medicine. Medicine's very, far too complex for that sort of thing. And uh, if you try that route, the thing's gonna come up and bite you without looking at the system as a whole. So there's a really interesting comment uh, in the chat window about uh, the priorities to fix. How do you create basically the priorities to fix things? And I think it's not, I don't think we should do it on basis of responsibility. I think we should do it on, the, and we do have limited resources and you're not gonna be able to fix everything in the next week or even month. Um, some of the things, and they tend to be lower at the control structure, but not necessarily, are just easy to fix, you know, or we can put in a clue, even if it's a jury rig thing to get us through the next period until we can do the more, uh, the deeper changes and the larger changes. Some of the things just are, you know, you don't change the culture of the hospital overnight. You, um, we can change procedures fairly easily, um, but we can't change the, the, the quickly, the, uh, the, how people actually behave. But, so uh, I think the list of priorities is not in terms of who's responsible, they're all responsible. I don't think there's any, any, um, uh, difference in who is responsible. Um, it, it, it was the whole thing didn't work right. But we can look at the controls that didn't work and figure out which are the ones that are going to be the fastest and easiest to do and maybe put higher priority on those. Or maybe we can, we can evaluate and say, well, there are some of them, they're a little harder, but they're, they're really going to have a bigger impact. Those are things there's no rules for. Those are things you're going to have to look at the list of things that came out, the learning, that you, and look at and say, you know, 
you're all experienced, intelligent people. We, we want to make a good decision. And that's, again, it's not a checklist. There's no way to do this, get this nice number. Um, what, we, what we want to do is make good decision making by people who are experienced, like all of you who work in the field and, and know the hospitals and the routines and can, can set priorities on what things should be done first. Okay, so it's getting, we're moving on. We will have more discussion at the end. Uh, thank you, uh, um, uh, Lawrence. Um, it, I, I hope it was helpful to go through a, a, an example. Uh, Aubrey's gonna give another one, I think. Um, Dr. Aubrey Samos uh, Williams um, is going to be speaking about some of her later uh, analyses and work that she's been doing. Thank you guys. Um, let me share my screen so you can see my slides. Good. Uh, everybody, can you hear me and see my slides? Yep, it's perfect. Sweet. Okay. Um, so uh, I just, I've got 10 minutes and I just wanted to quickly go through um, two projects that uh, I've got uh, one finished and, and one up and running, hopefully. Uh, in the Department of Anesthesia um, here. Unfortunately, I'm going to go in the opposite order of what you guys are doing. So we're actually going to start with the STPA project, and then we'll go and chat about CAST. So um, first, oh, so this, uh, this is the uh, paper that this is all written in. So if you guys want more details on this project, I, I highly recommend going to uh, our paper for that. Um, but the first thing that I want to say is I loved your optimism, Nancy, by saying that 99.8% of medication administrations go correctly. Um, I'm totally going to burst that bubble and say that uh, what we found, at least in the operating room, is that up to 5 to 10% of medication administrations have some type of medication error, which is a reasonably shockingly high number. That, when you look at the number of medications that we give during a case, translates to approximately a third of all anesthetics, so a third of all patients in our ORs will have some type of medication error. It doesn't necessarily mean that they take any harm from it, but that medication error, that hazard is there. And part of this has to do with the fact that um, when you're looking at the uh, way that we give medications in the operating room, it's very different from the way that we give medications on the hospital floors. Right? A lot of the checks and systems that they have in place, we completely override because in the operating room, as the anesthesiologist, I decide this patient needs this medication, I decide the dose, I draw up the medication, and then I administer the medication. Whereas on the floor, I might say, well, I'm the doctor, I'm going to write an order, and then the pharmacist is going to check my order, is going to fill my order, is going to give it to the nurse, who's going to again double check it, who's then going to administer it. So you've got more steps and layers along the way, whereas that just doesn't exist in the operating room. There was a really nice analysis done um, in the pediatric anesthesia world looking at uh, medication administration in the, uh, in the ORs that they did with failure modes effects analysis. And as you can uh, probably imagine, that really ended up focusing solely on frontline administration of medications. And we wanted uh, really to take that bigger look. So we did an STPA of the process. So we started like with all STPAs with our accidents and our hazards. Um, and these are, are reasonably clear and actually easy to apply in, um, in medicine, I've found. So hazard is just medication error, and there's a lot of work done in defining medication errors, but essentially we talk about the, the four or five rights or wrongs in this case, which would be wrong medication, wrong dose, wrong route, wrong time, and sometimes people add wrong patient. Um, and then these can then be linked to our accidents. Um, in this case, an adverse uh, medication event secondary to a medication error. Um, so adverse medication events um, may or may not be related to medication errors. So things like if you have an allergic reaction to a medication on your first time getting it, there was no way that you could have prevented that. There was no way you would have known if though you have anaphylaxis on your second time uh, getting it when you've had known anaphylaxis in the past. Well, now that's an adverse medication event that is secondary to a medication error. So those were um, what we defined, what we looked at. And our next step was to uh, model our system. So this is what uh, we ended up settling on for, for how medications are given in the perioperative realm. 
we went as high as um, sort of perioperative leadership. So um, we had uh, pharmacy clinical leadership, surgical clinical leadership, and anesthesia clinical leadership. And we called this sort of tier the perioperative leadership group. Um, these guys pretty much all set protocols, policies, um, and supplies of medications uh, as their control actions to constrain the actions of this layer below. This layer here is really managing patient care. This is where the, the cognitive decisions are happening, as well as the communication, um, coordination of care, those types of piece. So for example, I fit into this box as the anesthesiologist, right? I'm the one who's sitting there saying, okay, this patient needs general anesthesia. Um, they need to be induced with, say, automidate because their heart is not good enough to tolerate propofol, and I'm making those decisions. And I'm specifying these decisions to whoever is working in the operating room, whether it's a, in our institution, we have nurse anesthetists, we have resident um, like trainee physicians, um, or even if it's me, honestly, in this role too, right? Um, and this is really where the frontline, the execution of patient care occurs, right? So this is where the person in the operating room is focusing on caring for the patient and they're doing it via control of medications, using infusion pumps, getting information from monitors and ventilators and the electronic health record, the much maligned electronic health record. So this was what we ended up with for a control structure, seven controllers divided into three tiers and really almost three different um, silos in a way between the pharmacy, the surgical leadership and the anesthesia leadership, but all of them interacting. When we went through and identified unsafe uh, control actions and causal scenarios, we managed to find 66 unsafe control actions that we linked to 342 causal scenarios. Um, so we give a lot of examples in our paper to try to help communicate these ideas to people who didn't have the engineering background, but who were um, solidly grounded in the medicine of it. So this was, uh, we had a chart like this that, that specified quite a few different ones. Essentially, our control action, one of them was that the anesthesiologist specifies an anesthetic plan. The unsafe control action is that the anesthesiologist specifies an improper anesthetic plan. So one of our causal scenarios for that was the design of the electronic health record makes it difficult to find a critical piece of information that would change the anesthetic management. So this is a true like lack of feedback um, causing an inaccurate mental model. So uh, we even went further from the more generic causal scenarios to like very specific concrete examples to try to help communicate these ideas. So um, one example, and you find this across, I'm sure every anesthesia department, is that it's difficult to find airway notes, for example, from outside hospitals. Um, so then you might have a patient with a known difficult airway, but you don't know how they were successfully intubated before. And now you might say, well, I think I can put them to sleep and I think I can put in the breathing tube that way when in reality, they needed to be an awake fiber optic intubation in the past. So um, missing those key pieces of data can have very real clinical consequences. One thing that we um, did in our, our paper that people seemed to really respond to was uh, we actually broke down where we found causal scenarios. And I think that this in particular really helps to highlight the strength of STPA um, over other types of modeling systems that are used intermittently in, um, in the perioperative and, and in healthcare in general. Um, so here you can see that still 39% of our um, causal scenarios came from the front lines. And honestly, I think that's pretty easy to explain if you go back here. We have just so much more um, detail level at, at this level than we did at these levels, right? We just, we definitely zoomed in more here. So it's not surprising that that's the bulk of um, the bulk of the causal scenarios. What's interesting is that even with the, the lower level of um, detail at those higher levels, we got quite a bit of um, actionable things to, to really work on out of there, as well as out of this sort of management um, and decision-making level. So it's nice that with this tool, we could really show that we could go past just, you know, label your syringes better and here's a way to do it. Um, and really get into, you need uh, more like instant reporting and more communication from um, those leadership levels. Uh, things like national shortages of medications have very real consequences for people providing care at the front line. And this model allowed us to really capture some of that. So that was my whirlwind tour through an STPA. Um, but just to be mindful of your time, I, I think I want to move on. And uh, this is something that I've got a couple of my teammates uh, on this webinar learning more about CAST 
but uh, we really want to learn from our response during COVID. And I think that we can use CAST to do it. So when COVID surged in Massachusetts, our hospital went from six ICUs that were each somewhat specialized, right? A medical ICU, a surgical ICU, a neurosurgical ICU, those sort of things, to having 11 ICUs um, that all had both COVID patients and a random mix of non-COVID patients. So your former surgical ICU was now seeing you know, half COVID patients and um, the other half were including neuro patients and SICU patients and NICU patients. Um, and then we had two, uh, five of these units were totally new. They had been straight up inpatient floors or post-operative care units, and they were now suddenly working as ICUs. Staff were redeployed into um, really newly created roles in these ICUs to help care for patients. And clearly a lot went right, right? We got a lot of patients out of the hospital, but a lot went wrong throughout this process. Um, so we want to know what can we learn about what went wrong to do better in the predicted second surge, because we don't think that we're out of the woods yet. And it seems foolish to have these wonderful safety reports that we don't really analyze or learn from. So what our hope is, um, is that we have this overarching project uh, of which Leah Tron on this call is uh, leading. And part of it is looking at um, really structured interviews, qualitative thematic data coding to understand what providers saw in the system, what were their stresses, what were their concerns um, to really dig uh, from that data source. But we also have a lot of safety reports um, and the question is how are we going to use them? So I, I think our goal is to use CAST um, CAST is going to provide a good framework for contextualizing these safety reports. Hopefully it's going to really give us a nice visual model that can help people see what the system was. And I think that the model especially is going to be very useful because um, some of our surge ICUs were very different in structure. And I think if we can even just show those two models side by side with their differences in structure, people are going to immediately be able to grasp oh, so this one probably had these sorts of problems and this one had different sorts of problems. Um, I think that it's going to be nice to provide that um, really uh, rigorous approach to pulling data out of these um, safety reports because we don't have a lot in there. Some of them are you know, two sentences long, but I think that uh, really putting it into this framework is still going to be able to help us pull out a lot of information. And it's gonna be a really different perspective from the thematic coding of these interviews so that we can really help to triangulate the data. So what we're going to be doing is um, reading through our safety reports to figure out which processes we need to model. Um, we obviously had the operating rooms, but we also had labor and delivery where our um, anesthesia staff were. We had two major surge units, which were very, very different in style, which I think are going to be very interesting to look at side by side. And then we had our standard surgical ICU that took on a slightly different workload. So I, I think that these are gonna give us um, really interesting insight into the strengths and weaknesses of each type of um, ICU model and ICU um, sort of policy uh, to help understand that. We're gonna recruit experts in these systems to help us really create the control structure. And then um, from that control structure, uh, we're gonna take a small working group to actually go through the analysis using those experts as needed as questions come up, um, which I think is going to hopefully give us a lot of in-depth stuff to think about in COVID and hopefully on the quicker side, which is why I really appreciated hearing um, that in Wall's experience, this is a much faster uh, approach than other types of modeling systems. So I would love anybody's um, questions about the STP that we did and anybody's um, thoughts or input on uh, the cast that we are proposing doing at this time. Thank you, Avi. You, first of all, it's great to see you're still using these techniques. We haven't kept contact much when no. we went out for her internship and residency. We lost contact. And it's a little busy. Great. It's great to see you using these, applying these ideas. Uh, it also provided um, a, a, a really a nice uh, uh, transition to pro preventing these things before. So the first thing I we talked about was doing SPPA. How do we prevent these things? We don't want to just learn from accidents. Although obviously in the COVID, it's so new. It's a 
is a good way to start because you're, you get the accident reports to see this new kind of, of thing that's happening. The situation is new. Um, but the first part in your, one of the things, causal factors, and for, for example, you found was the EHR pro doesn't provide or is confusing about what medication had been been provided. Well, that's what happened at Rush exactly also too. The, the, the doctor and the nurse, the anesthesiologist and nurse didn't, couldn't tell from the AHR that the immunosuppressant hadn't been given. But that's true in a large number of cases. So mm -hmm. what we want to do before we have an adverse event and worrying again who's responsible, having to learn about, we'd like to be able to prevent these things and, I, and analyze and create control structures that are, are stronger. So um, what we might do is switch uh, immediately to Todd, but have questions and, uh, for both of you afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, after his, and he's going to, again, he's going to look at how you can proactively, before you have, have accidents, how do we identify potential problems using STPA and create better controls. So Todd. Great. All right, thank you for the opportunity to present this, uh, <clears throat> um, this work. Nice to see everyone today. Um, uh, Nancy, I wanna thank you for uh, my safety education over the years. Uh, I'm still very junior here in this, but, uh, uh, and I also wanna let everybody know that uh, we didn't get a chance to go over this presentation in detail. So if I misspeak about anything particularly related to SDPA or STAMP, uh, Nancy or anyone else, feel free to correct me along the way. And then lastly, before I get going, a uh, big shout out, thank you to Lawrence for kind of going through and, and working through some of the details of this presentation. So thank you, Lawrence. So the outline uh, for the presentation, I'm going to walk through an example of FMEA and STPA looking at the same process. It's going to be a simple a process that's not specific to healthcare because of what I'm trying to do is um, understand for myself, actually, and if it, if it spurs some conversation, that would be great as well, about the differences between FMEA and STPA. And then I'll talk about some of the specific research in radiation oncology related to FMEA and STPA, and then draw some general conclusions from that previous work and uh, mention where we want to go next with this type of uh, safety research. So we're going to start with a, a, a piece of equipment or a process. That's the goal here. So the process that we're going to start analyzing is these two boys surfing off the bed. What are the safety uh, concerns with this particular um, process? And First thing we, we do in an FMEA is uh, describe the equipment uh, or process. So we describe the, the process here with a process map, which we all know is just a well-defined sequence of, of steps and decisions that need to be made. Um, one of the key things to point out here is that the process map is very specific to the time order. It's explicitly stated what happens first, what happens next, and when decisions are made to, in order to complete the process. So for this particular uh, process, a process map might look like this, where we have a, a beginning, uh, the boys grab the board, they get on the bed, they position their surfboard, they lean forward, and then the boys surf off the bed. And that describes, uh, in terms of process mapping in FMEA, describes this process. So the next step in an FMEA is to pick one of these steps in the process and do a, uh, an analysis, uh, do, do a deeper analysis on that. So you can typically start with a, a process step that is, uh, you think would contain the most error. So boy surfing off the bed is where all the action is. So that's what we're going to analyze here with this uh, FMEA. So <clears throat> we start by asking ourselves what could go wrong and then you brainstorm or come up with ways uh, that that could happen and what the resultant uh, accident would be. So here are three of them. Boy, uh, the surfboard slips out and the boy hits his head. Or the boy lands on the surfboard but falls and skins his knee. Or one brother can knock the other off the bed and bruise his wrist. Now you take uh, one of these and you dive into a deeper analysis. So we're going to dive into surfboard slips out from underneath the boy and he hits his head. 
and we ask ourselves some questions. So how severe would it be where 10 is the most severe like death <clears throat> and one is uh, no severity at all. So in this case, uh, we could say if the boys hit their head, they're not, probably not gonna kill themselves. They could end up with a concussion. So we'll pick an eight out of 10 for that. Next question, we ask, what is the likelihood that this will occur? And we're specifically talking about uh, this type of accident. Surfboard slips out from the boy and he hits his head. 10 is it's guaranteed that it's gonna happen. One means it's guaranteed it's not gonna happen. Um, and so in this scenario, uh, looking at the boys, knowing boys are, are quite active, you can imagine it's uh, at least 50-50 or maybe a little bit better that this uh, accident could happen. So we'll give it a six out of 10. And the last question we ask ourselves, what is the likelihood that we can detect and prevent this from happening where 10 is a very low likelihood that we can detect and prevent it? And seeing where the parent or guardian is standing from where they took this picture, uh, there's probably not a very good chance that even if they saw the boys falling and hit their head that they could actually stop it from happening. So we're gonna say it's a relatively low likelihood, which means a high number. We'll give it a nine out of 10. So summarizing, what could go wrong? Uh, we're analyzing surfboard slips out from underneath him and he hits his head. How severe would it be? Eight out of 10, likelihood six. Likelihood that we can detect and prevent it is nine. And this is essentially an FMEA where that first um, line is describes the failure mode. Uh, then we have severity, likelihood will occur as occurrence, and then detect and prevent it is detectability. Next steps are to multiply those three numbers together, severity, occurrence, detectability, and get a risk priority number. So in our case, 432 is the risk priority number. In an absolute sense, that number has no meaning, but what one does is go back and do the same exercise for all the other failure modes. And then you rank those failure modes and take action on the highest RPN values. That's kind of the gist of it. And in this case, you can see the parent uh, in their head must have done an FMEA and they put some pillows there. And so that is an FMEA speak, um, a safety improvement exercise. And I mentioned the pillows here because at least from in, in my uh, non-safety expert clinician experience in doing FMEAs, what you tend to find is uh, at the end of the analysis is uh, the best thing to do is put another checklist in place or a timeout or some other safety barrier at the point of attack. That's what this tends to lead uh, one to. And so pillows are exactly that. So let's move on to STPA and analyze the same process. I put an asterisk here because uh, the next few slides are a, uh, a pretty significant oversimplification of the full STPA procedure, but I wanted to, to uh, keep it as simple and straightforward as possible so that we can get through it quickly enough so that we still have FMEA fresh in our mind and we can kind of draw some general conclusions about how the two uh, uh, prospective safety assessment approaches work. In STPA, uh, you also describe, in this case, the process. <clears throat> we don't use a process map. Um, we use uh, a series of control loops, which you see there on the right. I know we've heard about all those, uh, heard about these today already, so we don't need to go into too much detail, like just except to say that we have that controller who issues control actions that controls or moves the process uh, along to completion. That process gives feedback to the controller, and that's the loop that moves the process around. If you take multiple control loops <clears throat> for the different controllers in a process, you end up with a control structure. And that control structure is just a hierarchical model of system structure and operation. A key take home point here for me is that there is no explicit time order uh, in this control structure. It is implied in, in um, how the control loops are related uh, to one another and what information is needed at, at one point, but it, it is not tied uh, explicitly to uh, the, the description that we see here like it is in a process map. So right from the, the get-go, you could see this is a more realistic uh, way to describe a, a complex system because uh, we know that very frequently uh, uh, steps don't always happen in the order that they're designed. It's kind of the, uh, you know, work is uh, imagined versus work is performed. 
So the next step in an STPA is to determine control actions for the control loops that you're developing. So who or what is controlling who or what. And we're going to look at the parent as a controller. So the parent sets rules and limits for the boys. The parent, another control action for the parent is to stop the boys play if it gets uh, too uh, out of hand. And then there's feedback coming back to that parent, whether the boys acknowledge the rules and limits or whether the audio visual feedback that the parent is getting about the boys play. We're also going to look at uh, the control loop of the boy controlling the surfboard. So the boy transfers weight on the surfboard, gets the surfboard uh, to move and go off the bed, and that moving surfboard is feedback uh, for the boy. So we'll just look uh, at these two particular uh, control actions, one for the parent, one for the boy, just to, to make it simple. In order to analyze those control actions, uh, we follow a, a well-defined uh, uh, steps to do that. So first we ask, how can each control action be unsafe? And we ask ourselves these four questions. What if the control action is not given, given incorrectly, given at the wrong time or order, or applied too long, stop too soon? After we have unsafe, a list of unsafe control actions, then we ask our, ourselves, what are the scenarios that lead to those unsafe control actions? And that's what we're gonna describe in the next two slides. And so just a reminder, we're looking at the parent um, control loop and we're specifically looking at the control action of, of stopping the boys play if it gets out of hand. So how can the parent stop the boys play um, be unsafe? How can that control action be unsafe? So here are two examples. Uh, one is the parent does not stop play when the boys are about to fall. Uh, another is the parent allows the play to resume before uh, a boy's injury is healed say they got hurt and they wanted to get back in, in the game and the parent allowed that play to continue before the injury was healed, creating a, a hazard that could lead to an accident. So now we ask ourselves, what are the um, causal scenarios that could lead to these unsafe control actions? So for the first unsafe control action, uh, you could have a family dog that gets incited and jumps at the parent, distracts the parent, the parent's not uh, able to stop the play. Or as we see here, the parent takes a photo, to capture the moment, um, which also could distract the parent. Uh, for the second unsafe control action, uh, the parent uh, incorrectly believes that a boy who was previously injured is actually healed and ready to go back. Maybe because the boy told the, told the parent that, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm all okay and ready to go. So in this case, the, the parent is gonna have you know, an incorrect, uh, they're getting feedback and their process model isn't able to accommodate uh, the incorrect information that they're getting from the boy. So let's go on to the boy uh, control loop and analyze transfer weight forward. So following the same thing, how could the boy transfer weight forward be unsafe? A couple of control unsafe ways that that could happen. Boys apply too much force when starting to slide or a boy overcorrects their weight transfer during the slide. And <laughs> these can be unsafe in a number of ways. Uh, something that applies to both of those is the experience level of the boy. Either the boy is inexperienced in surfing off the bed or they could be experienced but not familiar with new equipment like a new surfboard. Uh, related to the boy applying too much force, uh, the boy could be inherently a risk taker and uh, are always going to end up in that type of situation uh, of applying too much force, being too aggressive. And then this uh, related to the second unsafe control action boy overcorrects weight transfer, the boy might be scared of, of getting hurt. <clears throat> and so that could lead to that unsafe control action. So the next step for us now is to devise mitigation strategies for all the unsafe causal scenarios that we uh, discovered in, in this process. So we have uh, pillows because if, the, if the, you could imagine uh, for the boy surfboard control loop, if the boy is scared uh, that they're going to get hurt, putting pillows there would, would uh, mitigate that. But we also have a number of recommendations for the parent as well, uh, where activity, you know, have the activity in a closed room, don't take any, so they can't be bothered by the dog, no photos, or the parent can do some practice with the boy first to deal with the experience issue. So another important point to make here is that this hierarchical nature of uh, STPA is kind of evident here where FMEA drives your thinking right to 
you know, the, the point of where the action's happening, but uh, STPA allows you to kind of zoom out in this case and look at the broader picture and see, hey, the parent actually has a role in safety related to what's happening in this, in this particular scene. Some observations that we can make between FMEA and STPA. So FMEA is very clear. You're looking for failures that lead to harm of some severity, whereas in STPA, you're looking for conditions that lead to hazards, which then may lead to accidents. FMEA depends, uh, um, uses risk that depends on occurrence probability. Uh, the thing to mention there is that occurrence probability depends on many factors. Uh, and if you're talking about an electromechanical device, you might have a very uh, well-defined uh, definition of probability of how long it takes a component to fail. But when you're talking about a process that includes human, really probability has uh, no no role there. So what you end up doing is just coming up with a fictitious, fictitious number um, that uh, you have no way to validate whether it's actually correct or not. And furthermore, it depends on scenarios. You know, if, if you come up with an occurrence probability, it, it may apply at, you know, Tuesday at uh, noon when everybody is sharp, but you take that same situation and move it to Friday evening at 10 p.m. when everyone's tired after a long week and it's a com completely different probability profile. So STPA doesn't use pro probability um, uh, in the analysis at all. Uh, I, I think in part because that probability isn't a realistic number that you estimate. So the goal with FMEA is to rank order results based on risk. And the goal of STPA is to really understand those scenarios that could lead to accidents. And for the, the bit of teaching that I've done related to FMEA and STPA in in my uh, part of, of healthcare, uh, if you give people uh, this type of training and you, you split two groups and you have one work on FMEA and one, the other work on STPA, the FMEA group spends 80 to 90% of their time trying to come up with the right numbers for occurrence and detectability and severity, where in the STPA group, they're just talking about how to understand the scenarios that lead to uh, accidents. So it drives thinking in very different, very different directions. Um, uh, lastly here, FMEA uh, treats safety as a probabil probabilistic component failure problem. Um, and STPA treats safety as a hierarchical problem of control. So this kind of is the essence of where um, how the difference between the thinking that one has between uh, using FMEA and STPA to analyze a uh, process or piece of equipment. So I'd like to talk about a couple of papers that were uh, published in uh, the radiation oncology literature related to STPA and FMEA. Uh, one that <coughs> Nancy and Aubrey, um, this was before the Williams was added, so it's just Aubrey Samos here. Um, uh, and then Derek, uh, Ryan, and Guaya or Grace um, uh, worked on this paper as well from, from my place. So we analyzed a a process that uh, wasn't created yet and uh, to see what the safety impl implica implications were. Uh, Aubrey, Nancy and I worked on the STPA, Derek, Ryan and, and Grace worked on the FMEA part. And I just wanted to pull out one table uh, from that paper and to that, that compares the results of STPA and FMEA. And first thing I want to point out is that STPA found causal scenarios. I know causal scenarios and failure modes are not the same thing, but just to give you an idea of the number of issues that, that come up, uh, STPA found about a little over three and a half times more than FMEA did. Uh, human behavior was a difference. A lot of the FMEA looks at the human and says, ah, the human failed, and therefore that's a, a failure mode. STPA drives your thinking in different directions, and we didn't find we didn't attribute as many issues to human behavior. And then organizational management is another big one. So again, FMEA really focused. Once you get that process map, you're so focused on what the steps are in order to get the, the job done. You're not able to zoom out and look at what the bigger, broader implications are of things like organizational management. So that's where STPA really has a uh, difference. Uh, the next set of papers. Uh, two papers that I wanted to mention uh, are related to uh, what was uh, 
uh, a new radiation therapy device uh, a couple of years ago. And so uh, it looks like a CAT scanner. If anybody's from familiar with a CAT scanner, the patient lies on the table and then they go inside the donut. And if you take the covers off of that donut, there's a bunch of components in there and there's a radiation beam that rotates around the patient and, and hits radiation where the, where the tumor is located. So a complicated device. So there were two um, parallel unrelated um, safety assessments of the system. The first one is, was on the top there was using uh, T, uh, FMEA. Task Group 100 is a, is a document by a professional society that advocates the use of FMEA. And they looked at uh, uh, specifically about acceptance testing and commissioning of the device. And then uh, folks at my place looked at uh, the clinical use of the, the new system called the Halcyon system using STPA um, we did acceptance testing, commissioning, and just the, the general use of the, of the system. So comparison here, acceptance testing found uh, 38 steps, 88 failure modes, commissioning was 24 steps, 54 failure modes. And for the STPA that included acceptance testing as well as the clinical, general clinical use of the system, we came up with 30, 385 causal scenarios, 144 unsafe control actions. I wanted to point out the conclusions of these two works. Um, the FMEA uh, paper uh, said that the failure modes identified suggest that quality control measures could be used to improve device, uh, design of the device. Whereas what we found on the STPA side, the device presents opportunities to streamline, reduce, or eliminate some traditional equipment uh, commissioning and routine QC activities and allow uh, others to focus their uh, attention elsewhere in, in the process. So that led us to start to think that, hey, look, with these new devices coming on board uh, are highly driven by automation and more sophisticated technology. Uh, it's probably time, the right time to redesign the workflow uh, from a, a safety uh, perspective. So our next research and two of my uh, previous collaborators um, are also from my place are also on the call today, Grace and Derek. And uh, so we're going to look at performing an STPA without predefined roles and responsibilities. So the group of people you see on the right there have very specific roles and responsibilities. Uh, we'd like to do an STPA without assuming who the players are on the field. Just what, what are the skill sets and knowledge that are needed in order to make the process work? And then we can use that as a fundamental way to redesign uh, the way radiation therapy is practiced with this modern uh, equipment. So in summary, uh, FMEA and STPA are fundamentally different. I hope that's, that's very clear now. Um, they are uh, solving the same problem. So there's gonna be some overlap in what the results are, but they're coming at uh, the, the uh, problem from completely different directions. Only STPA can account for complex socio-technical systems, and that's in part based by, uh, uh, because the STPA is a, um, based on the STAMP accident model, which is developed from control and systems theory. And then lastly, uh, we firmly believe that radiation oncology is gonna benefit from an STPA-based redesign of the workflow and clinical roles. So with that, that's it, my last slide. Thank you very much. Happy to uh, take any questions or discussion if there's time. Great. So now um, we're about starting the break time, but we're going to have questions too. Just, just again, want you to not feel guilty about go taking a break because this is a long, long session. Um, but both Aubrey and Todd, and, and everyone, anyone else uh, is off. Oh, we already have some questions. And if you want to actually make a statement, raise your hand. Um, so there's a question. What's the best material you have found or developed to train your subject matter experts who are healthcare providers with no engineering background? So let me just comment. This is what Lawrence's dissertation is about. He's working hard, actually. How do we how do we provide a procedure for people to do CAST? He's looking basically at CAST, but how do we provide a procedure to do that um, to, that will help uh, train them and also help them do it without 
uh, more effort than you would normally put into a root cause analysis. So, Aubrey and Todd, you, both of them, you can ask, answer the question. Sure, Aubrey, I, I can take a swing at the first one uh, there. So, you know, I, I think it's a two-pronged thing. You know, if you have a local safety expert, uh, somebody that has the, the, the responsibility uh, and then the time allotted to do the deeper dive and understand the whole structure, I think then it's just you go to the work that Nancy and, and John have have put together, there's there's the obviously the stamp uh, textbook, but then you also have some very practical uh, information that they can they can read through uh, handbooks, if you will, on how to do it. For everyone else that's just participating, I think you really need to distill it down. They don't need to know how the sausage is made. They just need to have a concept of like what is um, the the overall you know high level you know from a high level process. What where do they need to provide input? And what are they providing input about? So for my, in my mind, it's two types of training. You know, the, the local expert is going to do the deeper dive and really understand it. The, all the other folks that might participate in, in a, an assessment, whether prospective or retrospective, just need to have some rough idea what, what's going on. Um, if you try to make everybody an expert, then it's, you, you, never get, you never get going because there's just not enough time to get it all done. Yeah, and I know in particular, in, um the STPA that uh, I did. My, my partner in crime is Karen Nanji, and she's a, a medication safety expert, but she's never done anything like this before. And she's got a technical background, but, but way back when and hasn't really used it. But I was impressed at how quickly she picked up the concepts um, and, and picked up the lingo and the language. And by the end of our time on the project together, she is very much an STPA expert, uh, I think. Um, so I think that there's something to be said for this is somewhat intuitive too. Um, so once you've gotten people uh, up to speed with the, the language and the way you think, they can really hit the ground running. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I think that's part of the reason why FMEA has such a firm hold. It's just because it's so simple, mm -hmm. completely wrong, but, but so simple that people just, are, it's accessible. Mm -hmm. But I completely agree, Aubrey, that you know, if you break it down in the right way, you know, STPA uh, and CAST is simple too. A control loop is very simple, right? Oh yeah, I do stuff and then other people and then other things happen and stuff and I get feedback and I make a decision. It's very intuitive. It's just how you, you know, how we explain and get people, um, you know, connected to the, to the, the information. I think it's simple, but what I found in teaching people, when, when you learn it, it's really simple to do. The problem is it's a change in mindset. It's a way, a different way of thinking about a problem. And that's the hardest part, is to get people to, to see something from a totally different perspective. It's not hard to do. It's easier than all the other existing techniques, in fact. Um, but this change of framework, this change of mindset is, uh, you know, you need this sort of aha moment <laughs> yeah. to get people to. And we're trying to figure out how do we get them to that aha moment quickly. And there's another question here. How did I convince the management, uh, i.e. Yeah. What, with what model and how did, did I prioritize it? So <clears throat> for the the work that I've done has just been contained within the department that I, I work in. So I have a lot of influence there and it's not, um, it's not difficult to use new uh, uh, techniques because I can, I have the time, I make the time and I, I work through it with the group. If this was something that uh, reached outside the department at the level of the hospital, uh, then that would be a different uh, level that I would have to engage upper management to encourage them to use a, a different model. The challenge we have in, in the US at least is that uh, the, the Joint Commission, which accredits hospitals, uh, is still anchored in FMEA thinking. <laughs> you know, everyone's, I shouldn't speak so broadly, but like you hear a lot of, uh, everyone knows to say systems are important, systems theory is important, and we take a systems approach. Everyone says that, and then they, they grab the FMEA playbook and then <laughs> they use it, you know, or root cause analysis, and it's like, oh, I don't know how to break through that. I, I think I heard earlier, you know, 
we do need more publications in, in journals that are uh, more widely read. I mean, radiation oncology is, is a fairly small niche. Um, Aubrey, some of the work you're doing in, in anesthesia and the others, I, I think, are going to have a much broader impact in healthcare over time. But continued publications um, in these different outlets, I think, are going to are going to help uh, you know bring it forth. Aubrey, how did you do it? You're a little lower in the totem pole than Todd is right now. How did how did you get people to uh, management to allow you the time to do this and the research? Yeah, so I am much lower on the totem pole. Um, honestly, I the the first project that STPA I did entirely on my own time. Um, Karen had um, some leftover funding from a, a grant that she was on for patient safety, so she used some of that for her time um, and really uh, took it almost more as an opportunity to uh, to mentor me and, and use that kind of angle to to get at it. So so there was that piece, but once I did that, then um, I, I keep referring to this other project, but, but Leah Tron came out and said, I've got this problem. I've got all these safety reports. I want to analyze them. And then I could say, look, I have a tool that I think we can help with. And so I think really listening to um, your, your manager's pain points and, and being able to respond to those is helpful. So when she came up with a problem, I said, I think I've got a solution. Mm -hmm. Well, do you, uh, are you the management level or was there someone you had to talk into this? Um, I'm, I'm the same level of Aubrey, a bit lower because I'm well and truly down under, but um, the, uh, just luck, really. I did one talk on safety culture and somebody thought it was interesting and that person moved up to higher management. And uh, so effectively, uh, I, I feel a bit like, um, uh, in the Middle Ages, where you had a benefactor to somebody underneath you, and just happened to drag him around. I'm literally being dragged from organisation to organisation as that person moves. And as she moves up the food chain into bigger organisations, she's dragging me with her. And um, what's been lucky is I'm moving, hopefully you have to do some investigation. But it's just, it's just luck. I'm well down the food chain. Uh, she's a believer in systems, but hasn't got time to put all the stuff on it. So in her job interview, she said, I've got this really weird anaesthetist um, who you need to be listening to in terms of safety management. So that's, I'll be going down to Brisbane again to talk to them soon. Yeah. But there's a, oh. You jump through, you jump, you go for opportunities. You, uh, I was asked to give a talk to the Intensive Care World Congress on RCA versus um, uh, CAST. Uh, eight people turned up. Uh, to the after lunch talk. Uh, this is a World Congress. And one was sound asleep. <laughs> and the other three were friends who'd had a couple of drinks. He said, I was given a talk, we probably should turn up. I mean, opportunity wasted. <laughs> yeah. Those of you who don't have the chat window open, there's a great comment from someone who said that he starts the analysis on spec, delivers your first aha moment, and then ask for permission. That's what I do. Um, do you want to say something more about that, Alan? Um, okay, let's see. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, we, we you know, doing this in pharmaceuticals, which is a little different than the settings we've been talking about, we've been analyzing processes which include but are not limited to formal standard operating procedures. So we start with the SOP, but we have to obviously go broader than that, Inclusive, including the cases where someone does something and never bothers or recognizes to invoke the SOP in the first place. Um, and, and one of the challenge for us is SOPs are very, they think very sequentially they think swim lanes. They think you do step one and then you do step two and then you do step three. And it makes it very hard to get into this hierarchical um, way of thinking um, instead of a sequential and swim lane and responsibility way of thinking. So what I do is I, I say, look, indulge me. Let's get as far as drawing a control structure for this. And everybody loves because, you know, it's a big, impressive dry diagram with blocks and arrows. 
And then you pick a control action or two and you dig in and you deliver an aha moment. Ooh, I hadn't thought of it that way. And then you say, well, why don't we go to get go to your boss and get some permission to, you know, get some resources together and do this as a project. And that's that's my selling technique. Um, and it, it's been fairly effective and it, it works. Great, thank you. I don't see any more questions. Um, oh, here's one. FDA acceptance of SCPA versus FAMIA. Um, Todd, you might have, be able to mention that too, since you're also FDA here, or you're, I mean, you're US. Sure. Yeah, I mean, it's a, interesting. I, I don't know uh, specifically, um, I haven't heard anything specifically about STPA versus FMEA regarding uh, uh, at the FDA. I don't think they're like the Joint Commission. I don't think they, they require some type of prospective assessment of whatever it is that you're putting through the FDA. I'm not sure if it, they require it to be um, FMEA. The only, you know, the challenge is that, you know, everybody has heard of FMEA and it's just so accessible. So, you know, trying to break down the barriers and expose people to STPA um, might be a challenge, but I don't know if anyone else has any more knowledge about that than I do. Anybody else have any comments on that specific question? Okay, well, why don't we go on and, and then we'll have a, a, a discussion period for everyone who can stay afterwards. Um, uh, we'll start about um, at 9.30 probably our, um, our discussion and we'll have general discussion for everybody and everything. But let's go on to John, Dr. John Thomas um, John's going to talk about a little different thing. He's going to, so far we've been talking about manual processes and procedures. John's going to talk about how do you apply this to STBA to medical devices used in hospitals. Great. Uh, can you hear me okay? Am yep. I sharing the right uh, uh, screen? Yeah. Perfect. Always good to check. Uh, so I'm going to talk about an STPA analysis that was done on uh, intravenous patient-controlled analgesia uh, pump. Uh, I need to maybe calibrate uh, everyone briefly. This, uh, unlike some of the others, this was not a, a funded project and it, and it wasn't anywhere close to a one-year project. This started off as a class project with the students on the right-hand side in a class at MIT that covers STPA and CAST. Um, and, and after that, we've, we've put a little bit more work to polish some things up and, and put it into a presentation, but this is really a small scale um, effort. But I think it's useful to see uh, what you can get. Um, and, and I think we got some interesting results. So a, a little bit of background. Um, another thing I should mention is, uh, unlike a lot of you, I'm not a healthcare provider, I'm an engineer. Um, but uh, for, for even from that angle, I think we can, we can get some useful uh, things out of this. Um, if, if you're not familiar with these things, there's a concept of uh, pain management where a patient who is in pain no longer has to wait for a nurse to come and uh, administer something, they just push a, a green button here uh, and this piece of equipment will do it for you. So we've, obviously this is safety critical, uh, but we've got safety features. I mean, the, the manufacturers building these things are not ignorant, uh, at least we don't think they are. They, they have pump delays on these things. They have lockout intervals, limit on total dosage per time interval. I mean, how can you go wrong with these safety features? Well, somehow you can, uh, because we've got 56,000 FDA reports of problems caused by these drug infusion pumps, about 500 deaths in this four year period, 67% of them were due to equipment problems and the others were uh, operator related. A study was done of these smart pump infusions in hospitals and they found that 60% of them contained at least one error and a lot of them contain multiple errors. So of those errors, 65% of them involve violations of labeling and tubing change policies, very 
preventable, or you would think they would be preventable types of things. 87 of these infusion pumps had to be recalled because there were safety issues that were not anticipated when they were designed and when they were assessed uh, and approved. So we've, we've got some, some big problems, and this is kind of the easy thing. This is just the pump and equipment. Here, here are some concrete examples. We've had failures in the tube, clamps, syringe barrel, seals. Uh, we've had misprogramming where a 19-year-old woman went for a C-section and was killed by an overdose due to a program error that mismatched the drug dosage. There was over sedation, uh, extreme over sedation, which leads to respiratory depression and respiratory arrest, at least 15 cases. Uh, and, and this data is about 10 years old, uh, which, is, which is about when, when this effort was done. Drug mix up, uh, including hydromorphone mixed up with morphine. So, so really bad things. And this is kind of what might appear to be a simple a system, you just you know, program your dose and, and you know, very simple control of it, it might appear. Um, but the solution that's being proposed in some corners is to solve these things by integrating this with a lot of other technology to create an integrated clinical environment to oversee these infusion pumps and lots of other things. So we're gonna have interoperability between a whole network of these medical devices. We're gonna have new safety interlock systems to try to adjust the, address these problems. We're gonna have something that's monitoring a, a pulse oximeter, which is not normally done by the, by the patient controlled analgesia equipment, but this integrated environment could do that. It could read from a, a capnogram, it can detect patient condition alert, Clinicians automatically, and maybe automatically if the clinicians are too busy, stop the drug administration and do other things. So, I mean, kind of, uh, maybe from, from the optimistic view is that this is gonna solve all our problems, but I think there's also a, a valid a pessimistic view that, that's worth considering is we better be real careful uh, that, that, you know, if we can't handle a, a simple infusion pump, we better be real careful that we know how to handle this much more complex um, system. So, so let's see how we would approach this type of problem with STPA. I'm, I'm kind of assuming that our audience has, has attended the workshop or has been exposed to STPA before, so we're kind of skipping some of the introduction and getting right to the point, but there, there are four steps and I'm going to go through these four steps. The, the first step is to define the purpose of the analysis. This involves defining what we call losses and hazards. These are things we, we want to uh, prevent. So losses might be loss of life. Of course, we want to prevent that, but, th but there's usually a mission-related loss. Like, what if the patient's pain is not relieved? I mean, why are we even building uh, this, this PCA pump if, if we're not able to relieve uh, their pain. There are other losses that, that we might want to think about from a regulatory or financial or other aspects. Let's stick with the top two and we might have hazards. Hazards are, are system states or conditions that we want to prevent because they, they prevent the losses. In a worst case environment, they will lead to those losses. So two big ones would be that the patient experiences an, an opioid overdose or an underdose. There are other hazards we might look at. Well, let's kind of make maybe focus on, on the first two to get started. We'd do some more work in this step, but this is enough to set us up in the, in the short time we have to, to start looking at, at this problem. So the next step in STPA is to model the control structure. What, is, what does the control structure look like? Well, there's definitely going to be a control loop around the patient where we have this PCA pump. It's administering some opioid. It's maybe monitoring, that's a good question. What do we need to monitor? A lot of focus tends to go on the, the control side. If you, if you don't have a structured method like this, we, our, our attention is dominated by, well, the pump. That's what we call the thing, a pump, right? So we're gonna have to pump something in. Well, if, in order for that to work, we better think carefully about what kind of feedback is needed to make those decisions. So here's a control structure that we're gonna work with. This is the control loop I was just talking about. We've, we've got the control action, which is pretty obvious. We've gotta have some way for that infusion pump to administer some opioid and maybe some ability to stop the pump. Here's the physical pump, which might be seen as an actuator of sorts. It's gonna pump um, something into uh, the patient here. Uh, we have this administration and, and this pain relief that we have with, with the patient. We've got some sensor, maybe at a minimum, we're, we need to be sensing the flow rate uh, that we're injecting this stuff into the patient with. So that's maybe a, a primary control loop to, to look at here. But we've got another control loop, and that's this one. 
going through the patient themselves, right? So the patient now has the ability in this system to request and to kind of inject themselves in the control loop, re request directly without going through a nurse, um, I, I want some pain management, uh, so go. Um, so we've got that uh, control up over here, but we've got higher levels of control. Of course, we've got the clinicians, they're not gonna go away. They have to administer and program and configure this PCA pump and, and set the limits and things like that. We're adding this dotted box here, potentially, that, at least that's the proposal, this integrated monitoring system, which is gonna monitor uh, the, you know, not just the, patient, the PCA pump and the flow rate that it self-reports, it's gonna have control and it's gonna st potentially stop that guy, but it's going to monitor all these other pieces of equipment we've got in the in the room with this pulse oximeter and, the, and these other things, these vital signs from the patient and potentially have some automation, make decisions on its own. It's going to have to be configured and programmed by the clinicians. So you might think, are we, you know, in some sense, we may not actually be making the cl clinician's job easier. That's kind of how these are marketed sometimes. We, we may actually be making their job more complex. And at a minimum, what we can say, I mean, let, let's get the opinion out of it. Uh, what we can say concretely is we're adding brand new control actions that never existed before and we better have the right controls to make sure that that these things we're adding are, are not going to make things worse so we we, are, we ought to think about this control i mean it's not just programming that's not just open loop control we've what kind of feedback do we need to be providing to clinicians so that they're making the right decisions as they're programming these things or deciding whether we want to turn these things even on or off and enable them um, we've got some direct interaction, of course, between a clinician and, and a patient. We've got some emergency care. There's probably some verbal instructions about how to use this thing and so on. But, but hopefully we've got protection. So if the patient just starts hammering that button, that green button, we, we don't get ourselves into trouble. So this is the control structure that I'm going to use for the, the rest of these slides. I hope what I've described made, makes sense. I, I do want to remind you, uh, there are some things looking at this that I still would like to uh, change. This is something, again, it was an unfunded project and kind of something we've, we've done purely in free time, which doesn't really exist very much. Um, so I've got some suggestions myself to improve this uh, if I get a chance to. The patient really is, is the control process, ought to be at the bottom of the control structure here. And if, if anyone is in the audience uh, has some other suggestions, let's take it offline. I'd love to hear from you and, and, and maybe we can, we can put some effort into improving what's here. Anyway, let's move on though. Let's, let's just say this is our control structure. Keep in mind, by the way, uh, there's a lot more going on than just this. We can, we can look at the hospital operations management, hospital corporate management, Department of Health and Human Resources in the US Congress. We can go and look at the development of these systems on the left, not just the operations over here, but the development, which has a whole regulatory structure and you know, engineers are embedded in the control loop. And if they're doing a bad job, which maybe we are because we've got a lot of events that have been happening, we ought to look at where those decisions are happening. They're not happening in a vacuum. What kind of feedback are we giving to those engineers as they're making decisions? Maybe we're not giving the right, right feedback or information about operating events that are happening. Anyway, we're not gonna do that. I just wanted to point it out. Let's go to the next step, unsafe control actions. So we've got a control structure. We've, we've got to analyze this thing. How do we analyze this in, in a careful way? Well, that's where the steps in STPA give us guidance. We, we start with the control actions. There's some reason for that. There's an efficiency argument, uh, but I think I'll just move on and say that that's the way it's defined. So we're going to start with a control action. One of the primary control actions we would probably pick would be this, this control action in the PCA pump. To, it's got some controller that's going to say, okay, go administer this, this opioid or stop the pump, right? So let's look at that control action. And, and there's a framework in STPA. If you haven't seen this before, here it is. Uh, but I'm, I'm kind of hoping that, that you've seen this before. Um, Let's look at each control action. So we've got this control action to administer the opioid. This is probably an automatic or at least a digital control action that we're looking at down here. Later, we're going to go up in the control structure and look at these other control actions by the humans. But let's look at the, the machine. So the machine is going to decide to administer the opioid. How could that go wrong? Well, one way is if you don't administer. And how could that go wrong? Well, if, we, if you don't administer when the patient is in pain. Now, that is a problem. I mean, it's probably not our biggest problem. We're not going to prioritize this. We can, all those losses and hazards 
hazards you saw, by the way, I should have mentioned, those can be prioritized. Uh, pain management is probably not the biggest problem. The biggest problem is if we kill the patient. Um, but this is a problem. So this is linked to H2. What else can go wrong here? What if we provide um, the administer opioid command, right? We turn the pump on when the patient has already been given too much opioid. That, that'll lead us to age one or our overdose. That's, that's a big problem. We better make sure we've got controls for this. Another thing that can go wrong is, is we administer it in the right situation, but it, it's timed wrong. We've got, we're administering it too late. Well, that could be an important issue. And, and we've got to figure out what makes it too late. We've got to define this when we build the system so we know that the system complies and it, uh, and is not going to cause this kind of problem. We could put TBD if we don't know the answer in here. Next column, we look at uh, stop too soon or apply too long. So this applies to control actions with a duration. What if we provide the control action, we turn the pump on, it's the right thing to do, it's the right situation, it's on time, but we turn it off. It, you know, we don't keep it on long enough. We stop administering the opioid before adequate dosage is fully administered. And you can immediately think of the, the inverse scenario, which would belong here as well. So we would populate this table and identify how these things can go wrong. And of course, we have traceability throughout the analysis. Uh, these are linked to the hazards, which are linked to the losses. So we can prioritize every one of these. And in a moment, we're going to get requirements. And guess what? The requirements are traceable to all of these things and also are prioritized based on uh, the losses. So let's go to an, another control action. Let's look at the stop command, right? So we're moving up in the control structure, this integrated monitoring system that's going to network everything we've got in the room together. Let's look at, at, the, at the control actions that we want to prevent, right? And then we'll We'll dive into, uh, you know, behind the curtain how those things can actually happen and see if we've got the right controls. So if, the, if this integrated system does not send a stop command when the patient has too much opioid, that's one problem. If it does send a stop command when there's nothing wrong, that's a pain management type of problem. If it takes too long to send a stop command, and that could be seconds, we'll have to decide um, that that could be a, a pretty big problem. So we'll define these kinds of things. And I, I think maybe I'll just do... Um, I'm deciding now if I want to do one or two more slides like this. You're getting the idea. But I do want to show what it looks like for humans. So we've got clinicians in here. Um, one of the primary control actions here is to administer the PCA pump to decide, to decide to use it and to configure the thing. If they don't administer um, the PCA pump per uh, prescription or instruction, that, that could be a problem. If they do administer it, but the patient is not in need, and there's no need for, for this uh, PCA uh, infusion, or if, if some, for some reason the medication is not appropriate, um, that's a problem. We can think about what does this mean, medication is not appropriate. It could mean from the beginning that medication is not appropriate. It could mean that something evolves and it's no longer appropriate, right? So we can think about these different classes, but we'll, we'll start at a high level, these high level statements. What if we administer the pump too late, if there's some kind of emergency situation or urgent situation? In this last column about the duration, if the administration is interrupted, that's an interesting one. There might be ways that we could we could do that inadvertently. What if we do it too long after some physician, which is separate from the clinician, after the physician discontinues the order? Ooh, that's starting to get pretty interesting now. We've got this coordination problem. How is the technology going to help or hinder that kind of a problem. Um, all right, and, and another one that we might look at is again, the clinician, but again, their, their oversight of this integrated monitoring system, which is brand new and different from their administration of the PCA pump. So they're, they're now managing a lot of technology, uh, which is different from what they used to be doing. Um, if, they, if they program the thing incorrectly somehow, now this is a high level statement, we're gonna get more specific in a minute, but this is a starting point and, and so on. Again, we can do this again for the instructions that the clinicians provide. This goes off the screen. This would be instructions to the patient on how to use this thing. We could provide incorrect instructions. We may not provide instructions. Maybe we think someone else did and so on. Uh, but let, let's move, enough. Uh, move on. That's enough of the unsafe control actions, I think. Uh, but you can get the idea. Uh, we're basically defining the outputs of these controllers. These are decisions uh, reflected and manifest in actions that we want to prevent. 
this is part of the problem. Now immediately, certainly for the technology piece, as soon as we have these UCAs written on the left, we can immediately describe the safety constraints and requirements that we need to be satisfied. Must not send a stop command when the patient has too much opioid. So it has to have that capability to be safe uh, somehow. We, we must not send the stop command uh, unless there's a good reason for it. We don't want these spurious stop commands and so on. So if you're, maybe if, if these obviously really helpful for a device manufacturer, but what if you're in a hospital setting? Well, guess what? If you have this kind of analysis for other reasons, for, for defining procedures that you're gonna use, you can still use these kinds of requirements on the right because you have to select what manufacturer you're gonna buy from, what products you're gonna buy. This gives you a clue about whether they've designed a, a, a good system or not, whether they've covered the bases and, and met the, the functional requirements you have. So let's go on to the last step, which is to build scenarios. So this is sometimes where it gets really interesting. How do we take these UCAs? So this is an example of a UCA we just went over, an unsafe control action, um, and build a scenario from it. So let's look at this integrated patient monitoring system. This stop command can be unsafe. It, one way it can be unsafe is if the patient has been given too much opioid and we do not send the stop command, right? That, that's unsafe. How do we build a scenario out of this and get some insight? Well, we're going to use this basic control loop, which is the, the foundation of, of Stamp and STPA, right? We're talking about this red arrow, this control action. Controllers don't flip a Point to decide on, on what control action to issue. Well, at least we hope not. We paid a lot of money so that they're not random processes. They're, they're hopefully deterministic. So why in the world would this IPMS make this decision? Well, without having a design in front of us, we can actually reason about it. We can reason about a process model, a set of beliefs that all controllers in the world are going to have. And we can reason about what they might be and what kind of feedback would inform those beliefs. So let's try it out. One kind of belief is maybe it, it believes, right, we're humanizing this technology a bit, but it works. Even it works very, very well without knowing a lot about the design. And before you maybe have that information available. If it somehow believes the patient is not in an, is in an overdose, sorry, it does not believe the patient is in an overdose condition. Well, of course it's not going to send a stop command. Now, why would it believe the patient is not in an overdose? Well, look at all these pieces of information, right? We can reason about any one of them, maybe a combination of them. One factor that's really interesting and is a common factor is how is it going to piece together on a network all these different p p devices that may have not have been designed from the start to be used in this way. Well, when you've got a lot of pieces of information coming in, you've got to coordinate. And one issue is a timing issue. These things could be coming in asynchronously. They could be coming in, uh, you know, in, in, in a way that um, problems can happen on a network where you have maybe delays that happen in the transmission of these things. So one common practice is to timestamp all these pieces of information. So when you're receiving it, one of the things you would do with lots of pieces of information is check the timestamp. Is this an outdated signal? Was this sent a minute ago, an hour ago, and it's just a delayed signal? So one problem with that control is, what if something goes wrong with, with the timing of, of collecting all these pieces of information and putting them together. What if the messages are discarded? And they could be discarded along the network or they could be discarded, discarded by this new piece of technology on purpose because it's designed to discard messages if they're out of sync or if they're delayed. I mean, that's, that's actually a safety requirement from a lot of manufacturers. Well, that can get us into trouble. So we we've got to be thinking about this certainly at the device manufacturer level we've got to be thinking about this but you know what maybe we when we select uh what what devices we should go with or whether we even want this in our you know emergency room or operating room or whatever we we may want to um uh be looking at whether we want this technology or not. So potential solutions. I mean, there are some engineering solutions uh, that we might want to look at. Uh, there may be periodic synchronization checks within the technology that we want to be uh, looking at. So, so maybe don't just discard things if they're outdated. But I mean, you may laugh at, at some of these and think that this is obvious. But again, I'll direct you to my second and third and fourth slides where we look at all the events that are happening with, with these systems. We're having a huge number of events. Um, I, we've got a broad audience uh, out there tuning in. Um, I, I want to try to give you give a message for everyone. This is a very clear message here if you're involved in building this technology. Um, but if you're not involved in building this technology, you are kind of trusting the manufacturer to have done this kind of analysis and done their homework when they're selling it to you, right? Maybe if you're if you're not involved in engineering this, you can require them to do certain types of hazard analysis as as part of your 
um, is part of your supply chain, is part of your buying decision. You want them to be performing some kind of analysis. So maybe if you want to pick up these kinds of things, an FMEA is not adequate. You may want to require some other technique that can pick up these kinds of problems. Let's look at another uh, scenario, one that, that uh, the folks not involved in the technology might be more interested in. This involves a clinician. So let's take one of those control actions from the clinician. They administer the PCA pump when it's not appropriate. How in the world could this happen? Why would a, a well-meaning, well-trained clinician uh, configure this thing or turn it on when, it, when it's not appropriate. Again, we're going to use the control loop to guide this. We, we In STPA land, you don't necessarily have an accident that has happened to, to leverage. So we've got to have some more guidance built into the process to help us build these scenarios before they happen. So how can we do that? Well, all controllers have a process model or a mental model, right? So we can start there. What kind of beliefs could you imagine a clinician having uh, when, they, when they decide to administer and turn on the PCA pump? Well, one belief is they believe the patient is in pain, right? So that's, that's part of the, 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 the reasoning. And, and what kind of feedback would lead to this belief? Well, it, it, they might be seeing the patient complain about their pain, or there might be other fee less direct feedback that might be interpreted that way. What other beliefs do we care about? Well, maybe they believe that the PCA is already configured and they believe that it's appropriate for the situation, right? Where would that belief come from? It doesn't come out of nowhere. They don't flip a coin. It, it might come from maybe missing feedback or assumed feedback. They might not be aware that the PCA was previously disconnected for good reasons and make some assumption. Ah, now we're, now we're starting to get somewhere, right? So we're starting to build a, a scenario by using this, uh, using a control loop, right? Anchored in the control structure. So here's what we get. I'll, I'll jump the gun. Here's a clinician scenario number nine that came out of this process. The PCA pump is properly configured and it's appropriate, but the patient goes into respiratory depression. There was a problem. And the day ship realizes this and they respond. They remove the PCA pump as part of uh, their corrective actions and they override the alarm, which is another response to this. And, and it, it's, it makes sense. But then there's a shift change and the patient complains about pain. And guess what? We've got boom, boom. Both of these are now potentially met on, on the next shift. The clinician is not aware maybe of the previous situation, or if they are, they aren't aware of the reasoning maybe behind it, and they connect the PCA pump. It makes sense to them. And then a patient goes into respiratory depression for a second time, which is really not a, not a good situation. So we can anticipate this kind of thing happening. And we can design potential solutions. Now, there's, a, there's all kinds of solutions we can think of. We can think of technical solutions from an engineering point of view. What, what kinds of things can we design into this to help the clinicians do a better job? We can, what kind, and, and beyond the technology, what can we do in the, in the hospital in terms of procedures and information and, and how we design this thing to interact with the clinicians? We can have the procedures regarding PCA event communication and documentation. We can have this IPMS. Maybe it could automatically record the fact that we turned it off, which might be unusual uh, to, to turn it off immediately, and maybe it could record that and somehow have an indication that there was an emergency event already for the next shift. So, and maybe when they turn the thing on, if, if certain conditions are met, maybe we can prompt the clinician and say, hey, are you aware that there, there was an emergency event a couple hours ago? Or, you know, are you sure? Or maybe, maybe we can come up with better ideas even than that. But we should come up with something. Um, to, to try to build safety into our system and don't rely on people memorizing this or, or rely on people communicating this in the intent um, uh, by default. So that, that's a quick example of how we can use STPA to anticipate future scenarios before they happen. This is my last slide. Um, conclusions, there's a, a lot more uh, to do it, it, that could be done here, but the conclusions are this, this works. This provides a path forward to anticipate human actions, to software flaws, interoperability issues, captures system level behavior in context, uh, not just physical component failures with a pulse oximeter, for example, captures interaction accidents without any failure at all, accidents where every single part of the system is doing what they think is right, what they were designed and prescribed to do. Um, but we drop the ball on the interactions. They could be used to develop solutions to prevent these unsafe scenarios and elimination. Like, hey, let's not do it. Let's not buy this technology because we have unresolved problems. They're, they're going to take too much 
to, to try to control. Or we could try to make sure that the unsafe scenarios we find are at least observable and reversible, really important for a human factor standpoint. Um, that we this ties in really well with what Wall was talking about in the first presentation. We've got this scenario that's fundamentally not observable until the patient goes into respiratory arrest. That is not a well-designed system. We can make sure that these missing feedback loops are detected before an event and make sure operators and product designers can, can put the right controls in place. We can also apply this to social aspects, not just to the technology itself. All right, so, so that's it. That's what I wanted to, to share. Hopefully it gave you a, a, a glimpse at how STPA can be applied in this framework to both the technology and the, and the social side of things. Um, I, I guess we'll turn it over to questions. I've got to check how we are on time here. Okay, great. Thank you. So we've got some, some questions. I'm going to quick answer myself because this is my chance to have some input. Um, so about the user interface. Yes, user interfaces are included in the analysis. Uh, John just didn't talk about it because we were talking about a general one. What the analysis does is provide the requirements for safe user interface, the early analysis that John was talking about so that we can create a safer um, a user interface. And the comment says there's a lot of literature on the usability of these devices. Exactly, that's the problem. Usability doesn't mean safety. In fact, making things safer can make them less usable. So usability says you don't want the operator to have to do things, here's a simple example, do things twice or three times. It's not very usable, operators don't do that. But that's the only way to find a, a, a uh, maybe the, the best way to find a user input error. So usability is not safety. And that's what the problem is. People have developed all the usability things, but they don't understand safety. And so our user interfaces have lots of prob safety problems. The other thing is, and there were interesting one, one was about making the, the control structure more um, usable by non-engineers. Non and, and I think Lawrence would love to hear from you. Uh, we'd certainly love to know how to do that. We need an, I think it has to be different for every, every application area because every application area is, is going to be think about systems differently. And the other thing is, and I'll let everybody else talk, um, is about um, training, the production engineers have been trained to think about in terms of processes and, um, and it's embedded, of course, in FEMIA and all those other tools. It doesn't seem to be the case for stamp methods. Exactly. That's what we're getting rid of. That's the paradigm change. The, the old paradigm says think of things as processes. The new paradigm says think of things as controls and control loops as a control problem, not a process failure problem. And so we have to be careful about putting too much connection between them because we then people don't get away from the old thinking. But you, you know, these are all problems we're working on, I'm working on for 20 years for this, trying to figure out how to explain this to people. So I'm gonna open it up uh, and we need more questions and also the people who have spoken may have some co same different comments or the same on what i just said so nancy i might jump in and uh i guess suggest this one point i was just looking it back up because there was an earlier question on the acceptance of stpa or stamp based methods within the fda and i just uh, recall that i think back in 2018 there was actually a gentleman from the fda itself that came to our workshop to present it on extending stpa to improve analysis of user interface software in medical devices have you heard any follow up on that? Like, uh, do you know if uh, FDA is like continuing with this um, journey of exploring? S uh, I think, yeah. I haven't tried to deal with the FDA since 1985. How many years is that? Um, a lot. 35 years or something. Um, it's a lot of power, believe it or not. It, the power and all the, the requirements and other things come from as Todd and, and the others know 
uh, at least in this country, the power comes from the users and the user association. And FMEA is sort of pushed by the users, actually, in radiation therapy. Um, and those are the people on these kinds of international standards and other things. It's not coming from the FDA itself. So sometimes the government, at least our government, doesn't have a lot of power and control. Uh, and they're there is well versed and trained in these old methods and, and don't really all understand them. But there is some appreciation at the FDA about why this would be better. But they have no, I've talked to them about this, they have no power to change any of the standards, which are industry driven. Got it. I, I think folks. Everybody else? Have a, Todd, you, you fought this. Yeah, I mean, oh, I, sorry, I agree with that. You know, they don't, they don't, um, my, my impression is that they'll, as long as you explain it, they'll take it. They're, they're not in the, in the business of refereeing, which, you know, uh, approach is better than the other and things like that. So I don't see that they would explicitly exclude it. I think they would take it if it was explained and they, they understood it. The interesting thing, at least in, in radiation oncology, what I've heard from the vendors is that what they submit to the FDA or how they go about, uh, you know, doing, they, they all have to do some kind of prospective safety assessment of their equipment. Um, but what exactly goes to the FMEA is somewhat of a guard, is a bit of a secret from the vendor's perspective, because they, they have to really open full kimono and they're not, you know, about their technology and they're not uh, willing to do that. We've asked them if they would share their safety assessment that they give, they provided to the FDA and they'll give you parts of it, but they won't give you the whole thing. I've had uh, contact with medical device companies uh, on STPA specifically, and some uh, interaction with the FDA. And there's an optimistic side to this. Everything that's been said is is true, uh, but there is also a, a bit of an optimistic side. There are some large medical device uh, companies that are using STPA. I don't believe that they're submitting it to the FDA. They're, they're not doing it for regulatory compliance. They're doing it because it works and because they're trying to get an edge over their competitors in the marketplace. Um, but there, there are large companies using it um, in industry. I don't know that they're driving the standards. This is a problem we've encountered in other industries. Uh, there's like a, there's like a, a mountain that you've, that you've got to get over where on the upward slope, People are adopting it because they think it gives them an edge and it does give them an edge and they find out as soon as they start using it, they get real data that tells them that it's giving them an edge and that removes the incentive to put it into an industry standard. They don't want their, this is on the ramp up uh, on the other phases it's different, but on the ramp up, they, there's resistance to, to having others. So we would like to, that's one of the reasons for this event is to try to s spread the word. Uh, you know, of course, MIT is, is in a different situation. Our mission is to spread knowledge. Um, so we would like you know, any advice to, to try to break out of this, but I think that's where we are right now. Now in other industries, the good news is once a, a, you know, a large majority of, of the industry has, has been using it for a few years, I mean, the secret's out, the cat's out of the bag, and that incentive goes down. And then it starts getting proposed and driven into industry standards um, because there are advantages to doing that on, on a broad scale. Now, that's from an industry perspective. From an FDA perspective, they're kind of lost, but they know it, they recognize it. This is not my judgment. This is straight from folks in the decision-making authority. They've come to Nancy and I and on an aerospace panel and on other panels where they have, you know, they don't belong, but they've come, they've sought it out. And the comment made when, when we're introducing ourselves, you know, why are you here? Well, I'm here from the FDA, right, because we have the equivalent of a Boeing 737 crash every two days in the, in the healthcare industry. That is insane. We, we had two crashes in a year and, and that was, you know, that dominated news for a couple of years. Um, we, they have, in healthcare, we've got the, you've probably seen the IOM reports and, and others estimates 250,000 a year and 400,000 a year is the highest I've seen of, of medical errors and things like that. Um, that that is insane, really, compared to other industries. So they are actively seeking out you know, advice or, or things from other industries. The problem is 
they're kind of, um, if, if you've read, uh, you know, cargo cult science and, and things like that, they're kind of reaching out to grab whatever they can. I, I'm not sure they have a lot of direction right now, uh, but they recognize the problem. I feel like they recognize there's a problem, there's a big problem, and they are looking actively for solutions. I think what needs to happen is industry needs to, you know, maybe start submitting the STPA work they're doing to the FDA, or we need to find a way to strengthen that, that connection. So to, to give some direction, but I think the motivation is there. I think, I think they're actively searching for a way to, to fix things. There's another cultural problem I don't know how to deal with. There's, there's a culture in this industry of, of tradition and tradition it kind of has, it says a lot, it has a lot of power, um, both from, from kind of a healthcare standpoint, but from a medical device standpoint. When you're designing something new, it's, it's advantageous in this industry to argue that it's not actually new, that it's following this, the same type of design in the same type of processes as we have for 30 years. Even if the technology is drastically different, there are regulatory and other reasons we, we want to argue that. So there's some cultural maybe resistance to to acknowledging that that we need something brand new here it's it's going to require a different mindset from the fda and from industry but i mean again the industry is already using stpa so there there already is acknowledgement we've just got to get that maybe strengthen the interaction with the fda um, and maybe find a way to steer them and you know share some of these results with, with folks in the decision making uh, point decision making point of authority i guess Thank you. Are there any, uh, I don't see anything in chat window, but would someone like to raise their hand if they have questions or if they just want to make comments on these, these issues? I'm waiting for people to find the, their hand raising. It's in the participants. <laughs> to get participants on your screen, then you'll be able to see the hand raise if that's what the problem is. Are there some final comments that everyone, that, that the pre presenters would like to make? Um, so Aubrey, is there, are there any other final comments you might make? Uh, you see seen all of this. Yeah, I think um, my, my final pitch would be, um, obviously the space I'm working in is not industry, so it's fascinating as I find the industry discussion. I think that um, a lot of the patients that we harm come from our very human systems in our academic medical centers. And uh, I'm very excited to try to just keep pushing this work out. And it's, it's been fun um, of late to see that as you engage more and more people, you get a lot more engagement building. Um, and so we've got a very active and interesting discussion about how are we really going to expand this um, beyond our small working group in the department um, to, you know, the full anesthesia department and then up to the hospital level. So anybody who wants to think on that, I think that's really the next place that we need to go. Yeah, I would guess that, you know, your success in doing these is, is going to get attention at your hospital at least, and hopefully then other places because you publish these things, but um, that you know, we, we change people's minds by actual success in projects, <laughs> not by talking about them theoretically to them, <laughs> right? Um, and so I think, you know, the work you're doing is really um, going to be, have an impact. And of course, all the hospitals and or most, many of the, the partners hospitals anyway, the Harvard related hospitals are all tied together and I'm sure there's lots of also interaction there. Yeah. Wall? Ah, uh, you're muted. Apologies. Okay, start again. <laughs> um. If we are going to make progress, uh, I think we just need to be collaborating. One of the, the sad things about medicine is it is such a conservative industry. Uh, and that, uh, and the reality is that only about 10% of what we actually do is based on science and, and proven science. So while we, in this space we're talking about tonight, we're trying to think of a logical way and why aren't people adapting this, that's not what's going to make it take off. Um, 
it, it's going to be some trigger in terms of communication. Uh, we're going to have some amazing case that we present. It'll be some emotional en engagement from administrators. And the classical example uh, of this is that everybody's bought into WHO and it's absolutely fantastic. In actual fact, if you look at it, um, there's no evidence that WHA has improved patient outcomes in any first world country ever. And the original paper actually showed no improvement at all. But it was this emotional engagement that people had. If we do this, we can improve safety outcomes. And it came just a couple of years straight after the Jawara's human paper. So a couple of things lying in. So we need something like that. So there's no science in the WHO. In fact, there's papers published in Australia that show we need a lot more research on this to say if it is going to improve outcomes. And there's still no definitive paper from it, but everybody thinks it's the way to go. Uh, and this is where I, I'm, I'm trying to think of, if we're going to make progress in this space, um, we're going to have to think a little bit just outside the square in terms of looking for a logical scientific way of, of making some progress. Um, and, and I think the key may well be some international collaboration, at least sharing plans, uh, sharing, um, uh, moving the thinking of the world from the cognitive onto that systemic uh, might, might give us a little bit more hope. Because we're still going to hear things uh, we, we need to improve. And it's really, really sad that the case that uh, Aubrey presented uh, has been happening worldwide every year for 20 years. Uh, as a training registrar, I wasn't involved in exactly the same case uh, 20 years ago. Uh, and uh, so we, it, we'd, I'd like to think in the next few years we can make some progress before I retire. <laughs> Pat, do you have some final general thoughts? Yeah, I mean, the, you know, I, I think we, it, I, I think at least with, you know, my academic head on, I, I think the thing that, that comes to mind is, is getting more publications out. Uh, the key, uh, at least one key is to get them into get the publications into journals that uh, kind of cast a, a wide net. And so at least on the US side, um, the Joint Commission has their own journal and they have a category of, of paper that is, you know, uh, new new techniques or novel techniques. I know STAMP is in, in, in STP is not new, but from their perspective, it is. And so that could be a vehicle that has a very wide audience at the administrative level that could then trigger, you know, the next, maybe it, maybe it gets invited to a conference after that or something. So that could be an avenue that we could pursue. Uh, certainly I'm not uh, an international uh, vehicle for, for this kind of thing isn't coming to mind, but if, if anyone knows of a, of a journal that's in that kind of category, not hardcore research per se, but more uh, general information uh, that would be uh, that might be a, a step another step forward in the healthcare space. Lawrence, do you have some general comments? Yes. So what I would say is that um, at the end of the day, with the stamp-based tools or even just the way of thinking with stamp itself, if explained well, is is actually quite intuitive and quite easy to understand. That being said, I think we can all recognize that to try something new takes courage and takes effort. Um, I would also go out on a limb to say that, hey, you know, like there are various level of sophistication in how you can apply these tools. And I myself, for example, is still learning to be the true masters like Nancy and John. So I am on my own journey as well. But I think what is important to recognize is that um, we want to help you to take that uh, first step. And we want to help build the training wheel so that, you know, you can experience for yourself how to gain the new insights that other tools simply would not provide you. So we want to achieve that and we want to work, from you, work with you. Uh, the other aspect that I want to touch on is sort of going back to what uh, Wal and Todd and several other people have mentioned. I think there's a lot of good that can come out of collaborations. Like, can we share some uh, safety control models or can we just share the thoughts or uh, lessons learned from building these models or using the tools. And I think that would really lessen the learning curve for everybody. So hopefully we can uh, get on that journey and share some additional ideas and uh, way to do things as well. Great, good. Okay, John. I, I, don't, I don't think I have anything uh, new to add. 
but we're we're very interested in healthcare. Obviously, we we set up this to try to encourage uh, collaboration and and to share knowledge. And I I think we'd love to hear from folks who are interested in in learning more and pursuing a, potentially a project or a pilot using these techniques. I think that's that's part of the uh, strategy that we need to have to uh, to make progress. Oh, and you, you just gave me an idea. I have a class this semester, and they're just about to start some projects, student a class projects that they get to pick themselves, one in CAST and one in STPA. And I have at least three people in the class. It's very unusual for me to and who are interested in healthcare. Um, some of them actually wor have worked in the field. Um, so if anyone has wants some this would be free because the students are of course just learning but then it doesn't cost you anything they would be able to use this as their class project and uh everybody sort of wins from from this hopefully um so it, I think it will it will require your time so you right you'll be Good expected point. to talk to the students explain the system and the problem maybe provide documentation but um, financially it's free and review the view the results they get they'll do the work the analysis but you're going to have to review uh what they've done and see whether they're whether they understood the problem and got something good so that would uh, help them learn um i've got one I, now. uh and that fits in with john's work um one of the functions of that very pump is using the alaris is there's a safety switch that pulls out that actually clamps off. Everybody is aware of that. People, yeah, Aubrey would be very aware of that. Do you know the failure rate of that clamp, Aubrey? Uh, we don't use the Alaris, but the one that we use is a Sigma pump and it, it works exactly the same way with an emergency clamp. And we had an issue where the emergency clamp didn't trigger and somebody got a huge bolus of um, a vasopressor and uh, got quite hypertensive. Yeah, and uh, the last case I presented at the workshop was uh, we had somebody with a clamp didn't work and I got a huge dose of a vasodilator <laughs> and, and the chest got reopened. So the uh, three days, five days ago, I was doing an emergency cesarean section and the syntocin infusion induction was running and the clamp didn't work. And for some reason, I just made me on the ball and I looked at that and I thought, oh, that one shouldn't be running. So the interesting is that if I'd probably gone for another 15 seconds, the baby would have died. Great. Uh, okay. Well, I, oh, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Don't so, go ahead. I just, I, you paused. I thought you were. Oh, uh, so yeah. So it's, um, it, it ex it's exactly the same problem that's happening worldwide. It, it's happening with this pump. It's a perfect thing for some students for MIT to start examining. Uh, because Aubrey's had problems. I've already presented a, a cast report on it. It happened to me the other day and it was just luck. I happened to notice this thing was dripping as I'm racing somebody to the theater for an emergency section. And was it the midwife's fault? Well, you go back. She didn't, you know, I pulled it out. That always works, doesn't it? Well, she's a f first year midwife. You know, there's some things they don't teach you at uni uh, and uh, or colleges you say over there. So it'd be a great one to start with. It's applicable around the world. So that sounds like a great research project. Somebody's going to have to help us so we don't know how to write. I don't know how to get funding from medical things. Uh, I only know how to do it from, from yeah. engineering organizations and it's different. So, and we need to always need an MD if we're going to get funding from ARC or from... Our, our experimental collaborative worldwide cast analysis of, of a medical incident that could then be a generic model for things that's going to be happening around the world. But if anyone wants to participate, that would be great. Um, if anyone wants to help what, give my students, a supervisor, one of my student projects for the class, at least it's not very long because the class is over in a, six weeks. Um, oh, it's, happened to me. it's happened to Audrey. John's already done half the control diagrams. <laughs> so send me mail so I remember. Um, and uh, we're running out, we're over the, a little bit over the time and I know everybody's very busy and probably has other things to do. So we will officially close the session. Um, uh, if anyone can stay around and, and still wants to chat, um, 
this was, we're happy to do it. Um, so, oh, someone in the blood service. Oh, yes, there's an absolutely great, I've done some stuff with the blood service. Actually a great uh, example. Um, and so, uh, thank you all of the speakers. You did a great job. Um, I really appreciate your spending the time because I know you're all really busy people. And um, same with the audience, you're all busy and that you uh, took out this much time from your schedules. We really appreciate it. And please um, write any of us. Um, we'll get you everybody's email if you need it. Uh, Aubrey, I think, is, gave her email in the, in the chat window, but if anyone needs it, we'll send out these. Um, send them to Lawrence. <laughs> send your request to Lawrence. He, he has has more time uh, to, to find everyone's email. Um, so with that, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.